this company designed an AI program that creates versions of creates Seinfeld episodes. And so it, it creates a crude animation and storyline, but it's like a Seinfeld episode based upon past Seinfeld episodes and stuff. So and it's obviously so super cheesy and very, very crude version of it, but it's a it's a step in that direction. You know what I mean? It's just like the earliest stage of that. You know, the final stage of that could be in 20 years, like AI could be making entire TV programs or entire movies completely animated completely ai no one's acting in it there's no real voices in it everything is done by an ai but it looks real that scares me and then it's who's coding it what biases are being put into the coding that we don't know about obviously you know any script or anything has a bias to the writer but does the coding have a non-objective bias for the kinds of content it's going to create but i I just think the, the worrying i worry about eliminating humanity from art which is the whole scary. the point of art is human expression. And so if you take the human out of the expression, that's scary. Welcome to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. In this episode, let's discuss films that involve humanity versus technology. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. We have a really interesting topic for today's discussion, talking about technology and how it relates to films in science fiction genres that depict the struggle of humanity with technology. And some of our favorite films are about technology, like Blade Runner is one of my all-time favorites. And it's a really fascinating topic that's still relevant today. And we're seeing the advent of really new technologies emerging. It seems like every month something crazy is happening. So it's still a very timely topic. And I like how even modern sci-fi films are diving into it in in more nuanced ways. Sci-fi is my favorite film genre. And I also love the humanity versus technology, man versus machine, whatever genre you want to call it. And today we're specifically talking about films where... It's technology that was developed by humanity, not like aliens coming to Earth, not a movie like Oblivion where that's aliens coming to Earth and taking over the entire planet. Spoilers! (laughs) Come on, it's been (laughs) out for quite a while. And we're not talking about humans versus superheroes, supervillains, or anything like that with these kinds of stories. We'll be superseding film and going into television television is too, talking about Black Mirror, but other films besides Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049 we want to talk about. Obviously, The Matrix, 2001, A Space Odyssey, The Terminator franchise, specifically the first two. Those are the two best ones. Ex Machina is one that I love. Moon, Gattaca... Tron and Tron Legacy, Metropolis, the great silent film, as well as Westworld, Minority Report, Source Code, iRobot, AI, Artificial Intelligence. There's so many great films that involve humanity versus technology, and it's not always dire. Sometimes it's something like the film Her from Spike Jones, where it's humanity versus technology in terms of integrating together to form relationships and love and kind of be on the same stratosphere until obviously AI supersedes us to a different point and enters a different plane. But I love the concepts of humanity versus technology because like Anthony said, it's so relevant in our world today where we're constantly hearing about new forms of tech that are being developed or already in development that are being released soon that sometimes sound really incredible, make your life a little easier, but also others that seem terrifying if they get into the wrong hands. And uh, it seemed like a lot of the older sci-fi films were more of a physical threat at a lot of times, like Blade Runner, like 2001. We got to in Metropolis in a way. In, so physical threat in terms of... Like being a physical danger to humans, where you have Hal killing off the humans, and you have Blade, you have replicants... Uh, on the run, taking out humans whenever they can for their own uh, self-preservation. And then we get into the area of, like her, is a more nuanced approach of technology, ex machina as well. So I like how, and also Black Mirror has some really great uh, advances of technology that seem so realistic and only a couple years out or a few years out, but also can have horrible effects on humans on on emotional and mental ways. And so I like how the storytelling has become more nuanced and deeper on more of a meditative scale and more of like, should we even pursue this kind of avenue? Because, I mean, right off the bat, I mean, Terminator is another one that's like a physical threat, obviously. But I I think saying just like a physical threat to humanity is is oversimplifying a really complex issue because all of these 
models, these replicants, these android cyborgs. It's artificial intelligence that's obviously leading to these kinds of situations, but also specifically with Blade Runner, these are replicants who aren't considered human, who are persecuted, who are trying to be free. So freedom is a, a major theme with a lot of these AI cyborgs. Obviously, something like Terminator or The Matrix with the architect, that's different where it's trying to control humanity and take over the world in a different way and do what they think is best for humanity sometimes. But I think with Blade Runner, it's a little more complex than it's just, they're a physical threat, you know what I mean? No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, I, but The Matrix, I think, is also a physical threat. I mean, it's the physical dominance of human species by technology. Turn you into a to, battery. Turn you into a battery. <laughs> but, I mean, th those are still probably all, all the best ones, yeah. too. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's, it has become a more, more layered in, in different kinds. It's not just a threat. It's more of, like, an emotional problem, like, being able to block someone so like so, someone can not actually physically see you anymore like in that Black Mirror episode that's an amazing and horrifying concept of someone obviously can ghost you and block you on their contacts on their phone on their mobile device but to actually block someone in real life where whenever they look at you they just see a blank image like a blank space that's a horribly terrifying I think even in a lot of ways more terrifying than a physical threat. You know, something like that can be emotionally damaging. I think what Black Mirror does in so many of their episodes so well, which we'll get into like the specific ones with the tech they use, is social social ostracization and social exile, not by your own choices, but because of the technology involved in the world. I think the one that that Bryce Dallas Howard stars in with that social media app, that one was social a, credit system, so ahead of its time. Seems too seems too real, and might be, maybe we'll be there someday in in uh, the Western civilization. Hopefully not, because. It's really odd to see the social structure when it happens because of this digital social app and uh, it's like a social currency of your interactions with people and you're just being putting on a completely fake persona because you want to have a good rating for your app and to you can only enter certain spaces or interact with certain people or people will look down upon you if your rating's like under five stars or under four stars. It's Everyone's like rating your interactions with them. It's like yeah. an Uber driver. Like you're not going to get picked up by someone that's got a 3.7. Like something might happen. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. But I think they do a lot of brilliant forms of technology that are, if not being developed or are pretty soon to being developed here in the world. The, the advancement of technology, it is oftentimes a great benefit to humanity. I think that GPS is one of the greatest devices ever, like one of the greatest technologies ever created. I mean, just we grew up in an age where you didn't have GPS and to now have it regularly, like you can just open your phone and your Google Maps or Apple Maps, Maps can tell you how to get anywhere. It can also give you an estimated time of arrival. That's insane for people who grew up in before 2000. You just leave the house yeah, and figure it out. It's it's an unbelievable resource. That, Take a left at the train tracks. Yeah, and to this day, I yeah, because we grew up like there was a point where we had to like print out map quest directions uh, and we had to like take notes and you had to like memorize places and people would have to direct you and you have to like make a list of turns and stuff. That was how you got around, or if you had like a map book in your car. But GPS, I think, is something that's really improved society in a lot of ways. There are so many other technologies that have improved. I think obviously social media and the internet have its problems, but it has created a connectivity between cultures that in a un, in a way that was never before imaginable. And I think that has it's an important aspect to the a benefit of social media and the internet, although it does have so many bad aspects to it as well. So not all technology is, you know, threatening and oftentimes it can really benefit us, but there is technology where it's like, should we even pursue this? Should we continue this? Is there a dangerous path towards this? And what I love about all these films is they'll show how that will, how that technology story will play out in like the worst case scenario, which is a lot of fun. So many pros and cons to technology, yeah. and we're so fortunate to live in the world we live in. You know, I, I feel grateful every day. And, you know, I can use Google Maps to get to a restaurant and get some food anytime I want, which is incredible. And people take it for granted, I think. Postmates, yeah. Oh, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. We're so lucky and fortunate. But, you know, technology, pros and cons, one of the main pros is lifting the majority of the planet out of intense poverty where people were just living it. The ma vast majority of the planet was in intense poverty for the entirety of civilization until, you know, the Industrial Revolution and technology and the advancement of globalization with technology. So that's a major pro is lifting a lot of people 
out of very dire situations, decreasing the numbers of world hunger and everything like that. And obviously, there are super cons to this where people are taking control over technology, whether it be social media, using it to their country's benefit to manipulate people, manipulate uh, pol political things, and manipulate situations in their countries or with other countries. So there are a major cons of pol a pol give and take of all technology. And there's, <clears throat> there's drawbacks to even the benefits. Like, so the Industrial Revolution obviously changed the world. And I believe, if I'm correct, the world poverty scale was, what, 90%? I think like, it was higher. Higher than 90%. And, and, it, and the Industrial Revolution lifted the majority of people on the planet out of uh, abject poverty. And the industrialization obviously built the world we live in now. And it did have so many benefits. And it changed the world in, a, in so many immensely positive ways. However, a movie like Metropolis shows the downside of something like the Industrial Revolution where... Uh, the many of the the workers and the underground layers of the city and the city on the surface is beautiful has these amazing skyscrapers and there's a lot of very successful people the businessmen who who run these companies and in these industries but then you see the lower layers of the of the city and it's just all these super low class citizens who are working and toiling away on the gears and the mechanics and the wheels of the spinning wheels of the industry and of like basically the the industrial revolution and so many people are suffering to make this the cogs in the machines continue to to spin and so and so many people lose their identity they lose their individuality they lose lose their humanity because they end up becoming just a workforce a mindless workforce that just has to punch in and punch out every day as a means to stay alive and that is absolutely an, a, one of the most brilliant depictions of the the tragedies of the advancement of technology. Metropolis is a really special film. It's one of the greatest of all time, especially in the sci-fi genre, especially just from a filmmaking standpoint, whether it's production design with the miniatures and how they just expanded the scope of what a film could do back in 1927 in the silent film era. And costume design is terrific. Having a cyborg for a main character was so fascinating. People have really never seen anything like that on that scale before. And basically, it's this world, like Anthony's talking about, where the top is this oasis. The city is this beautiful oasis, this utopia, where everyone lives in peace and harmony. And these skyscrapers, they're all wealthy, they're all elites. But then the bottom levels of the of the city, that's where all the, the slaves and the poverty and, and, the, and the workers live. And they, they're sacrificing themselves to this machine. There's so many great sequences and, and production design elements of them, like basically walking into a fire pit of smoke with a giant demon mouth is the opening of, of the doorway to represent that they're sacrificing their souls to this cog that at least talking about this engine to keep the utopia upstairs above them running, which they'll never be able to meet. And the, the metaphor is it's not just like one company, it's the city. The entire city. Yeah. And what's really fascinating about that, how you lo you said how the workers have lost their human spirit. It's it's kind of both the workers and the people who live on the upper utopia. They all kind of have lost, lost their souls, whether it be the workers losing their souls to this factory system, which was created by the Industrial Revolution, which a lot of people are still living in, in terms of like being a cog in a machine. And you, you've lost your your human spirit, your, your sense of life and your soul. The people up up. In the utopia, you can argue they have lost their soul in a different way where now they've just lost their humanity in terms of controlling other people and accepting the sacrifice of others and, and pursuing only wealth for and, and selfish pleasures as well. And also, it's, it's a great metaphor for how technology can be an, an illusion because the machine person, it takes the form of the woman, the lead the lead actress. The machine woman, the machine the cyborg. Woman, yeah, it takes the cyborg takes the shape, the shape and look of the, of the woman in the film. And then fools Frederson, the the big boss, into thinking that uh, she was a real human being. And then the fire reveals herself as being a cyborg, and he's tricked, and this cause this leads to his death. So being fooled by technology is, uh, I think, another major theme in Metropolis that's really timely. Well, because there's the dark woman the dark cyborg and like the good cyborg and the dark cyborg there's the great scene where she's seducing all of the wealthy elites inside like that gentleman's club and yeah. she just becomes a, a form of seduction to seize power and control and destroy all of these these wealthy elites which is at the, actually happening down the bottom as well where they they burn her basically as a sacrifice as as the cyborg so it's a really great contrast of what happens with that cyborg what's it called the she's called the machine person. machine mensch the the mensch, machine mensch. machine mensch machine mensch because it's machine German. person machine mensch the machine woman yeah 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 machine woman yeah well in in the translation is machine person 
Is it machine person? I yeah. thought it was I thought it was woman, machine woman, mensch. Machine person. I think it's woman in German. It could be. Yeah, I'm not I'm pretty sure. Someone someone who speaks German can let us know. Yeah, someone 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 let us know who's correct. But I love <laughs> technology versus humanity themes in films and, and some of my favorite questions that get raised include things like what does it mean to be human and i think some of my favorite ones that involve that are obviously the blade runner films even the terminator films later on especially t2 where our t800 played by arnold is kind of questioning his humanity and almost maybe gained self-awareness at some point and especially later on in the in the later films where he gets the name carl and everything well in the in the new one in terminator <laughs> uh what was it uh genesis no the one after that dark fate dark fate he like has like a wife and he's a, he has a wife and stepdaughter and he's like living in a cabin just like living a normal life like a like a human being. So he could you could maybe make the argument yeah. that he's become self aware and self conscious. That happens obviously with Blade Runner with the replicants, specifically Rachel the first Nexus Seven replicant who you can assume becomes self aware because of the fact that it's revealed to her that she's a replicant and her memories were implanted, which we'll get into obviously. I think that's the best one. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Also, Ex Machina dealing with Ava was she ever self aware and. In that film the ai cyborg that nathan created did she ever gain self-consciousness or was she just trying to pass the puzzle the test that her creator had given her also films like moon where we were involving obviously we're getting some spoilers here if you haven't seen some of these movies so a spoiler warning for moon the moon moon starring sam rockwell written and directed by duncan jones does sam have sam is obviously spoilers a clone many clones of sam are created and then they die out is each version of Sam a unique human being, have a unique soul, or is it the same copy so they have the same identity and same soul, or is it someone new? Yeah, and also in Source Code, which is another Doug and Jones film, what they think, it, what the military thinks is creating just a small simulation program is actually creating an entire verses. So it's creating a multiverse every time that Jake Gyllenhaal's characters put into the Source Code. It's creating a whole new entire universe of souls. It's like every studio right yeah. now, they yeah. get a hit. <laughs> yeah. We're going to make an entire verse out of this. Yeah, yeah. so that it's another thing where it's like, it, are these, is this program, is it just numbers, ones and zeros, or is it, are they, is it creating like real life? And that's one of my favorite aspects to that movie, the question that poses. That relates to Tron and Tron Legacy, the ISOs, which are called, they are called the isomorphic algorithms, which obviously when Kevin Flynn designed the grid and designed these programs and he was able to travel there he later found that isos these programs were created naturally they just sprung to fruition they were created who knows from where and they were not guided by any coding any principles any algorithms and they were free although they were eventually they were also persecuted by the other programs at the same time and then also what's it's also a couple of instances where stories are trying to show humans trying to create humanity through technology uh, so megan is a more recent example of trying to create a a lifelike humanoid doll robot for to to bond with children especially children who have had a loss or traumatic experiences i but i think one of the best examples is there's a black mirror episode where a woman's husband has passed away and donald gleason plays the husband and she's grief stricken and full of trauma and can't move on with her life and then but there's this company that can recreate a loved one through technology and first they create uh, an AI interpretation of his voice. So she starts video she starts phone chatting with this AI who has her husband's voice and then video calling. And then the she orders uh, a cyborg version of her husband who looks exactly like her husband, talks just like her husband. And at first she's super happy, but then she realizes that there's no humanity in this thing and it's not her husband. I thought it was a brilliant example of humans trying to create humanity through technology that just failed. Ava, uh, Ava with Ex yeah, Machina is yeah. another great example of that where Nathan, the creator of this massive social media company, Search Engine, is trying to develop AI and he uses his search engine to basically create the brain and the artificial intelligence of what Ava would have for her mind and for her brain. And I, I can't wait to break that down and talk about and debate whether she was self-aware or self-conscious. Nathan actually created Ask Jeeves. <laughs> Ask Jeeves. <laughs> he also created the paperclip for, what is that, Microsoft? <laughs> yeah, Microsoft Word. Can I help you with anything? <laughs> Can you get rid of all the periods? Hey, thanks for asking. I don't know what a period is. <laughs> Clippy, right? I think Clippy, yeah. Some other questions that I think I that these movies pose and that I adore is 
we've been talking about earlier is humanity meant to be replaced by technology are we supposed to keep going on the in the route of these technological advances should we be pursuing these still when we can see the potential ramifications whether it's in film and tv but just from theories from great minds and thinkers is like is it a good idea to keep pursuing ai is it a good idea to keep pursuing facial recognition and face swapping and in deep fake technology because it's getting scarier and scarier every every month even though the videos are fun with the deep fake stuff but it's pretty scary especially like maybe if you're not from a country where you see like a massive political or celebrity icon saying something that they didn't actually see that could be probably potentially dangerous or hazardous if you're from somewhere else if you see that deep fake looks to me like one of the most dangerous future technologies in existence and it is getting really scary accurate it's, it's like there's a few really popular accounts like there's that guy who does the tom cruise impression and he must have similar features to tom cruise which is why his tom cruise deep fake looks so real but what's really scary is that it, it started out with like just people basically up close in the camera deep faking but now deep fake is getting pretty accurate with someone standing pretty far away from the camera wide wide angle shots and you can see their full body and the face and the face is looking pretty realistic nowadays i think it's a scary technology going forward it could have a lot of dangerous side effects once it gets to be extremely difficult to decipher what's real and what's not real and when you factor that and combine that with like the voice of a person you can just you can inter you can make a version of a human being that in uh, and just do whatever you want with it there's like the, the arnold schwarzenegger one that people keep putting into movies mm -hmm. it's scary how close it is just putting arnold schwarzenegger's face onto a movie character from some random movie it's really i think i think it's a worrying technology and it's kind of like people aren't taking it seriously it's a funny thing it's become a meme thing but I think it has a lot of possibly possibly dangerous ramifications. It reminds me of Equilibrium. So Equilibrium is a movie that Christian Bale was in in like the early 2000s. I think it was before Batman Begins, after American yeah, Psycho. Yeah, it was 2002, I think. And it's in this kind of future supposed utopia where all of humanity has basically been dulled down. They've lost their their way to their their they don't have feel, emotion. Their ability yeah. to feel. So they take a medication to to not feel anything. So yeah, they take this medication every day. They're supposed to. It's part of their their society every day you have to wake up and take this pill until the character played by christian bale he doesn't want to take it anymore he wants to he's like starting to feel again there's this underground revolution and rebellion that's building that he ends up being a part of and kind of being like the white knight to save the world and free everybody and in that film there's a political leader who for the most part whenever we see him he's kind of just he's just a projection of this person it's it's vice something dupont vice council dupont it's actually the guy who plays robert uh, the Bruce in in mm -hmm. Braveheart, Angus McFadden, the same actor, and you never really see this this leader, but they try to make it seem like he's giving these speeches in public. He's like in supposedly in this podium that's glassed off for his safety. Spoilers, obviously, but like we find out that there's never ever anybody inside of that container during some of these speeches. And it's always just kind of a, a hologram projection of that Wizard person. of Oz. Wizard yes. of Oz, same yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Actually, it's a really Very good point. Very much like Wizard of Oz. So using technology to be able to control people, whether the person exists or not. Same thing kind of with V for Vendetta, even though that the Chancellor exists, but you're only seeing a virtual representation of him if you're a person of the mass. Same with us. We really only see political leaders online for the most part, unless we go see a speech or something like that. So you're living your entire society based off watching people virtually. You're not actually interacting with them in real life or seeing them in real life. But I think Equilibrium is a great example of that. And also finding your humanity back again from being controlled by techno technological, biological, chemical advances in society. And also, V for Vendetta is a really great example of, you know, technology being used against the people in a dominant fashion, in a totalitarian manner, because it uses both facial recognition, um, as, uh, what's it called? Like, they're constantly listening, constantly watching, constantly monitoring every citizen with cameras with uh they're they're literally drive the government has agents driving around in vans listening into households and that's also a future technology it does happen in other countries that can be very worrying the constant data spying of corporations and of governments it's a it's a technological power that is very troubling and can have horrible side effects on cultures and on societies and on and on citizens 
And you see it in a lot of movies. V for Vendetta is a terrific example of it. And it is a dangerous technology. And one thing where one side of the argument is it's for protection of people, it's for the you know protection of society, but then also you're taking away people's privacy and their individuality by constantly monitoring them. And then t- technology is getting more advanced where you, there are facial recognition cameras all can be placed all over cities and like they can identify you left and right no matter where you go. Minority Report is another wonderful example where the eye recognition, the eye scanning, every train you walk into, every store you walk into, your eye is getting scanned, whether it's closed or open, like and they can determine what you purchase. Like Tom Cruise's character walks into Gap and they're like, would you like to purchase the another pair of those khaki pants? He's wearing the eyes of someone else who shopped at that at a Gap recently. And also just how the government forces and police forces can they can track anyone and minority report is another great example where he's on the run he can't really go anywhere with his eyes because they're going to find him no matter what room he walks into no matter what street he what street corner he turns into they're going to find him so the constant tracking and analyzing and monitoring of citizens is a very troubling technology used in a lot of great films in in minority report Obviously, it's the eye recognition. It's really the face recognition that's happening now and cameras being put everywhere. Yeah. It's really a light example of it, even though it's really just mostly used in that movie for consumer products, consumer goods, as well as their specific for- branch of the government, their police agency yeah. for tracking. But think of that on an entire domestic scale for a government in terms of tracking versus just trying to sell you a product with like McDonald's or something like that. So I think that Minority Report's a fascinating example because that movie was made in what, 2005? 2002. 2002. Yeah. Holy crap, and it's still relevant <laughs> for technology that's like being developed and uh, added to our society right now. But again, it's really kind of like a more of a simplified version of it for this narrative cinematic purposes of that film, which are scary, but also at the same time, it's really interesting. But now when you want, do you want that implemented in your society though, when you think about it? Yeah, and also Black Mirror has done a great job of using augmented reality in, in Blade Runner as well. Augmented reality where you're seeing the digitized ads or apps or what have you uh, around you in the spaces around you. And eventually, I mean, with contact lenses as a future, like computerized contact lenses as a future device that will be used, we see these in Black Mirror episodes. And that's something augmented reality where you could walk into a store and there'll be like, you'll be seeing ads for things or maybe you'll... Everywhere you look, there's something that's scanning you, that's trying to show you something, advertise something, or allow you to maybe purchase something. And that's something that Black Mirror has done really well in a few of their episodes. Minor Report's done on a smaller scale in Blade Runner as well, but it's definitely something that's happening. It's going to be a regular occurrence if you're using these kinds of technological devices. It's something that I think is like... if you go walk, if you just like walking outside, don't do you want to be exposed to this at all times? And that's something that it's a question. And I think Black Mirror does a great job of, quite, of raising those questions. It's like if you try to read an article online, you're bombarded with <laughs> yeah. ads everywhere. I get it, Wall Street Journal. You got to make your money back. But <laughs> God damn, <laughs> BuzzFeed, I can't even read an article these days. There's like, dude, you go on one website's article and there's like six clips are playing and a couple of commercials. It's a Hyundai like, ad, yeah. McDonald's. It's like, I it's just want to find evil. out who, who invented Beanie Babies. <laughs> can't I just ch- find out? I'm just checking out the box office of the week and I can't. <laughs> I don't want to watch 16 clips of ads. But that reminds me and makes me think about Ready Player One. Yes. Obviously, Ready Player One is this futuristic, non-utopian world, dystopian world where the society is just so bad and everyone's in dire poverty around the entire world that they escape in this virtual reality program that this guy created. It's a really incredible movie. Spielberg made it. And it's an awesome book. Way more detailed, obviously. But... In this virtual reality world, everyone escapes and now your currency is involved with this program. It's kind of relating to digital currency in our world now where we get to the point where we have one global digital currency like in Ready Player One, like in that program in the game. What, what do they call it? I can't remember. Um, the the, uh, o- the Oasis. Oasis. In the Oasis. Will your monetary worth be social credit systems inside a virtual reality program inside the oasis kind of like that 
and your entire life is there. You can create the kind of person you want to be, the look you want to have, whether you want to be a demon monster or you want to have purple hair and, and like be like a like a lizard guy or just a normal person or whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you or want. A pop culture figure. Yeah, you can yeah. you can look and dress however you want with your avatar, just like a lot of games and platforms allow you to do now, like like Fortnite and some other games and you, the character customization on these games right now is ridiculous. You so pay for it. If you, <laughs> exactly. So will that, it, will, will we start to turn into a direction of a, a augmented reality, virtual reality, where even the corporation tries to take control over the Oasis and their plan is to put all these ads over your vision. That's why I thought of Ready Player One, where yeah. all you're seeing besides the Oasis is click here, click that, click that, is a corporate, if that happens, Will it be obviously what were other ramifications for society, but also if a an um, evil corporation whose only concern is to make as much money as possible takes it over. But also, Ready Player One, its other main theme was you should you allow yourself to be to escape into this with all of your time. And they have a great the ending of the film is a great balance where they take like Wednesdays and Thursdays the the Oasis is off and you can't enter the Oasis and you have to like. For, you have to still live in the real world. You have to make out with your girlfriend yeah. at <laughs> Dope Apartment. <Yeah. laughs> it's a pretty great loft. It's a great loft. So that, Allison that, Hightower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you said it right. <laughs> Alison. <laughs> Alison. <laughs> so the end of that film, it's, I think what I like about that film is it didn't say, we can't have this technology. It was like, we need to have a balance. We need to you know, use it sparingly. You can't let it take up your entire life. Because I think that's, the pro uh, that's a worrying problem with especially VR, once VR gets to the point where everyone's going to have it in their home and video games are going to be unable to be discernible from real life, it will be extremely difficult to get people to be pulled away from that. And I think that's a, a troubling outlook for VR where it could be so addictive and so escapist that people won't want to live with the, live in the real world. People don't wouldn't want to... Uh, deal with the re reality they'd rather just you know enjoy the vr escapism of something like an oasis and that's that movie had a great ending where it's like this is a great technology there can be a lot of benefit from it but also we need to live in the real world as well and try and find a middle ground happy area where we're doing both there's also an argument to be made you know whether you agree with it or not where is humanity meant to embrace technology to reach new heights are we meant to evolve with technology as a part of us is it something that we have to continue to grow and develop because that's what we're meant to do you could make that argument that ar vr kind of we're already cyborgs with these smartphones in our pockets 24 7. are we meant to kind of keep going in the direction of infusing technology with us biologically which we'll be getting to eventually at some point in the next couple of decades putting technology inside of ourselves, inside of our bodies, inside of our wrists, inside of our brains, getting a chip somewhere. Some people already have technology infused inside of them, whether they have a disability, you know, if they have a hearing aid or, or something inside of them. So obviously there are, are pros and cons, and it's amazing when technology can help people with ailments or disorders or a disability. That's f so incredible. And they can, you know, live with it and, and live a life worth living without that being an ailment on them every day of 24-7. You know, imagine what it's like to ha not being able to hear and then you have a chip implant in your brain or, or like The Sound of Metal is a great film involving that where, you know, he accepts his fate of being deaf now because he tries to fix his life with technology with the chip implant. Well, he doesn't he doesn't accept his fate until the end. That's what I said. But no, until the very end. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh -huh. I said at the end of the film, he accepts his he eventually uh -huh. accepts his fate at the end of the film of being a deaf person because he tries to infuse technology into his ears inside of his inside of his head to hear again but once he hears what the technology does he embraces the fact that this is my life now and this is how how I am this is part of me and I shouldn't try to fix it or replace it because I don't have to be fixed I don't have to I don't have to have this this isn't a problem it's just part of who I am now and I have to embrace that just like many of the other people in that film so that's an example of trying to use technology to fix a problem that really shouldn't be a problem if, if you just accept who you are. That's actually a great movie to point out. Yeah. Nice job. I just, just came up with it on the spot. I could tell. It's, it's an it's awesome great. movie. Well, it's, there are some really great movies that depict uh, the advancement of technology through biology. And the, the, I think Gattaca could be the, the peak of it where we have the society where 
parents can choose all the attributes of their children that are made in labs, and they can choose what color hair they want. Do they want them to be physically fit? Do they want them to have certain kinds of skills or abilities? Or uh, do they want them to be artistic? Do they want them to be a good writer or, or analytically smart? All sorts of uh, d dynamical dynamics and attributes that they can assign to their child that will be grown in a lab. Can and, I? Can I? Exp I have a little. Oh, yeah, sure. Description of what it's yeah. called. So it's called the Embryo Project. This is an excellent movie starring Jude Law, Ethan Hawke, and Andrew Thurman. Nichols made it terrific. Yeah. And so. The embryo project involves parents can produce children with the help of geneticists who use reprodu pre reproductive technology to selectively choose particular genes in each parent to prevent genetic disorders and to produce healthy and act attractive children. The film implies that selecting certain genes reduces an individual's propensity for violence, crime, and other undesirable behaviors, genetic manipulation, freedom of self-determination, and eugenics, the practice of advocating for genetic improvement of the human species through the selective pr reproduction, involve many of the themes of the film and this film depicted it in a beautiful way by showing two social classes the natural bro natural born humans and then the lab born humans and anyone who is born in the latter has superior strength superior uh, cardiovascular yeah. ma ma mental abilities cardiovascular abilities everything about them is superior to natural born and so the natural born citizens become lower class citizens they become the bottom of the barrel of the social class they're they're working menial jobs they're cleaning up after the other um society the other social class and it was a really incredible representation of how there can be a divide uh, and technology created this divide within people amongst themselves. It's an incredible film. And the lead character, his name is Vincent Freeman. Obviously, they gave him the last name because he was born without freedom because, like Eddie said, he's a lower class citizen. He's considered technically less than human. He's not even really allowed to enter the same spaces as these genetically advanced humans, these supposed perfect species, these perfect human beings that are created via embryo eugenics in this embryo project. And he's born in this family where he's the eldest brother of two. He was first born. He's a natural birth. Then his brother, but he was born with many health ailments. He's born with uh, respiratory issues, a heart defect. Eventually, they give him not many years to live. They think he's going to die young. And then they have, they decide to have the, another child, another son, but they go through the eugenics program, the embryo project to create the perfect supposed human being with their second son. And Vincent's entire life, his whole dream, even though he's cleaning the toilets and the floors of this science facility and the space program facility, his dream is to go to space someday, and he never gives up on that. And his whole life has been a battle against his brother, who's this superhuman, perfect human being that he has to compete with and tries to compete with, whether it's swimming, whether it's school, everything. And he's got a step down every time, every, every direction or every path they face each other. He's He's got a peg down. He kind of, it's unfair, basically. He can never can compete. So he has yeah. to have... Basically, you could say that he has twice the human spirit and twice the humanity of a normal person, of a superhuman, hu one of these superhuman, <laughs> superhuman. <laughs> I sound like a robot now. I am a normal human. So, I like cheeseburgers and the ball games. <laughs> it's a great debate of whether these superior human beings that have been created with genetic alterations, do they have as much humanity as someone like Vincent who was born natural birth because he's able to attain the levels and reach the heights of these superhuman beings that have been genetically enhanced on his own with all of the elements and all the birth defects and all the issues that he has in his life, whether it's his breathing, whether it's his heart, he's able to defeat every obstacle in his way to become that. He, he sacrifices so much, whether it's the pain he sacrifices when he tries to get taller because he's taken over the identity of Jude Law's character, who was is one of these embryo-enhanced human beings who becomes paralyzed, was it on a skiing trip or something like that, and now he's taking his place at this, at this job in this facility. And... He's able to do it. Does does he have more humanity? And do these other superhumans have less humanity? Do they have maybe less of a human spirit, less of a soul? Yeah. Are they are is, are the eugenic enhanced human beings more human? Is what that is, they're they're like the ultimate version of the human? Does that make them better as humans than normal natural birth humans? And it's a great 
great film with so many resonant themes. It's amazing. I and an, an, another film that plays with biology as a technology is obviously Jurassic Park in that franchise, most notably the first Jurassic Park, which really tackles those themes of just because we can do this, should we do this? And also the dangers of using technology to bring forth an entire species of animals that have been extinct for millions of years and do they belong to be sharing should they be sharing the planet with us at the same time absolutely not but once human beings came up with a technology and learned that they could do it they couldn't resist the urge to do it without stopping to ask should we be doing this because dinosaurs are cool as fuck <laughs> <laughs> should we really be doing this shut up steve it's gonna be <laughs> sick <laughs> but no that's a that's a great question because why stop at dinosaurs what happens next and obviously the the, the, the projection of that franchise and where they went forward <laughs> is... What? No, I'm just talk, thinking about the later oh. films. <laughs> is they didn't really expand on what could be done with the cloning, which I think would have been more interesting in terms of outside of dinosaurs. Oh, that's cool. Expanding yeah. outside yeah. of just this species. What if you did something else, like created other Woolly beings. mammoths. Yeah, or, other... other yeah. Or invent, in, invent animals. Uh -huh. Like, they kind of obviously create their own dinosaurs later on, more vicious. You ask for more teeth and more danger, and they make, like, the most dangerous dinosaurs of all time that weren't natural. But what... If, uh, it would have been interesting to see them not just have dinosaurs, but maybe invent other kinds of creatures or so, or something like that. You Why not? Write, you should write a story about that. That's, That's pretty cool. <laughs> it's a pretty cool idea. <laughs> it's just interesting because if I was them, I would have gone that direction because dinosaurs are cool. And yeah, the last one still made a billion, but it wasn't. Dominion was not as great a film, obviously, as the first two. Don't you, you can't one. even say that. It's just terrible. It was it's just terrible. It's the same thing over and over again. So if I was them, I would. You have this technology where you're bringing dinosaurs to life. Why not do something else with it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. But what's really cool about those two films is it's technology based, but it's not like a, it's not like a computer. It's not a system. It's not a machine that is the the villain of the story. It's the idea of creating this kind of bio biological advancement and sh how that becomes the, the the antagonist of the story. The antagonist of the hubris of humanity. Yeah. That's the antagonist yeah. of, like you said, we can do this, but should we? Yeah. Fuck it. Let's do it. Fuck it. Yeah. And cloning, it's really interesting. There are a ton of movies the about- The Sixth Day. The Sixth Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, man, we love that a great as a one kid. as well. But I personally, I think the best movie ever made about human cloning is probably, spoilers alerts, I think I brought this up earlier, Moon, mm -hmm. starring Sam Rockwell, where he is a clone. So this film takes place on the moon, where this character named Sam is by himself in this facility where he is in control and basically just uh, maintaining managerial operations over a mining facility of mining m resources on the moon for the industry, the corporation that he works for. I can't remember what it's called. Something Industries, right? I can't remember. So... What's happening to him is he's been there for, I think he has a cycle of three years, then he thinks he's going to be going home. He's been there for almost the entirety of his contract. He's excited to go home, but he's slowly starting to get incredibly ill. His body's falling apart, and then suddenly a new stranger comes around and saves him after he crashes one of his lunar, po lunar rovers, and it looks exactly like him. And I love the way that Duncan Jones plays this film where these characters, they obviously know they look exactly alike, but they're kind of skeptical about it. And like they're, they're kind of not addressing that issue immediately. Because if you saw someone who looked oh, exactly like... Oh, you're talking like, about like that five-minute montage yeah, of them. after yeah, he saves him and he wakes great. up, it's like they don't they, they haven't pointed it out yet because yeah. I think they're both so terrified that it can't be real. And maybe he doesn't really completely recognize what he used to look like. Mm -hmm. Maybe the fresh Sam doesn't recognize this emaciated, scary-looking Sam. But what's, all, what's really great about that film is once they do start tackling the idea that they're clones, the, the conflict becomes, I'm not the clone, you're the clone. You're you're the clone, and no, no, I'm not. I'm not the clone. You're the clone. But what they ended up learning is they're both the clones, and that's what's really great. Is that's what I think that movie showcases about the humanity inside of them and the soul inside of them, because they both think they're the real Sam. Ironically, neither of them are the real Sam, but in a way, they are a, a real Sam. They have the memories of the original Sam. The original Sam is back on Earth. They try to call their daughter, 
and Sam's voice is heard in the background, the original Sam. And I'm sure that Sam had no idea that he was cloned and that there were other Sams up there. And so once their cycles end, they die. They're supposed to go in this pod that will send them to Earth, but it really just incinerates their entire body. A new Sam gets woken up and he continues the process from a evil corporation standpoint it's very clever to have cheap free labor by just cloning the same guy who's been trained on every protocol of your facility to just clone him and have him be re rewoken up and destroyed every three years have a new one in there basically like a new program but does it's terrible it's evil that's why i said evil corporation i'm not promoting even it. though you're smiling <laughs> <laughs> it's very efficient it's, it's a great it's, idea it's, 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 it's like taking notes. it's horrible but i mean it's so clever and and sinister from a corporate <laughs> from a corporation standpoint. <laughs> but then the the great question about this film: Does each Sam have their own soul, their own humanity? Be, even though they have the same memories of the original Sam, and they think they are Sam, are they unique in their own humanity and their souls inside? Yeah, that's a, it's a great film that poses the cloning question. What do really you think? Well. Are they do they have their own souls? I think they I think that they have their own. Well, what it, well you get a factor in what is a soul and the idea to to think and the idea to have memories to draw from. How is that? How is how am I different from a clone of of me? So you're basically your your definition of of a, of a of a being with a soul is self awareness, self consciousness, self -awareness, and also human human experience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Being able to have memories, be able being able to think and. And have emotions if you in, in emotionally respond. I think that they have souls because how is that? How are they different from the real Sam? In what way? Exactly. Oh, I, I agree. I think yeah. they do have souls, but also the idea of self awareness or self consciousness versus sentience is a huge theme in a lot of these films, which which I really love talking about. And I don't in like I'm not to be confused with consciousness, self consciousness, self awareness is. Obviously, you're aware that you're a living being in this time continuum, in this world. You understand that there's, you know, past, present, future. You have memories like you were talking about, and you're you're aware of your existence. Human humans have that that rare quality on this planet, in this world, that we are self aware. It's believed that other creatures may be self aware. Like I think dolphins, dolphins. they believe are self aware. Potentially, I'm a dolphin. Or, <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they're thinking? <laughs> Yo, I'm swimming here. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing on that boat, man? So much fun. I love what, swimming. What are they doing? <laughs> but then, and then sentience, where sentience is not consciousness, not self-consciousness, but it's the ability to feel things. Is there a difference in a lot of these characters, a lot of these AIs, these cyborgs, these humanistic characters in these films? And I think that's a great topic to debate, the difference between self-awareness and self-consciousness versus sentience. Well, I think that 2001 is such a brilliant example of it with Hal, where Hal, when he's being shut down, he begins saying that he's scared. He says he, he does he, he he begins saying that he doesn't want to die and he's afraid and at first we thought that it was just like this murderous AI computer that's just trying to preserve the mission and do what it thinks what it what it thinks is best for completion of the mission and it sees it sees the men as threats to it and so it's carrying out basically what it, we think is just protocol just based on its coding but then when it's being shut down slowly and we hear it, its voice. We hear Hal's voice slowing down and getting in a lower pitch, and he's he's like basically begging not to be killed. I feel much better now. Yeah, and yeah, and trying to trying to be like, oh, I'm okay, I'm cool, bro. That is so revealing, and one of the most incredible aspects of 2001, where we thought it was just like this murderous computer, but it ends up being: is this a real being? Does this is this does this device? Does this computer? Is it alive? And it's, it's, it must be alive if it's afraid of death. The fear of death, I think, is the telling sign of for Hal, where it's not just trying to prevent itself from being shut down just for the sake of it, but it seems to not want to be shut down. And to have the fear of it, I think, is just so incredible and such a great touch added to the story and to the dialogue. He's technically the main antagonist of 2001 A Space Odyssey. I know maybe there are some people when they watch the film they think that the the aliens might be the main antagonist of the film, but really it's HAL, and HAL stands for Heuristically Programmed Algorithmic Computer. He's a sentient, artificial, 
general intelligence computer that controls the systems of the Discovery One spacecraft. He interacts with the space crew and he's part of the mission. And like Anthony said, his coding and objective is to preserve the mission. And when the astronauts think they have to change the mission protocols and, and, and change the course and do something different, that's when he starts to take them out one by one because he's trying to John preserve. Wick style. Yeah, he's not he's not a he's not a murderous robot, but it's just because of his coding that maybe they didn't prepare prepare for these situations uh correctly and also did he become self-aware? And how do these programs become self-aware? Is it I think for Blade Runner and these replicants I think they become self-aware when they're posed the question of or pose the reality that you are a replicant, your memories are not yourself. But it's also similar to 2001 A Space Odyssey when we have the opening with the apes and their tribes and their battles. And then, obviously, what comes down from the heavens onto, into the their obelisk. lives. The obelisk. The monolith. The monolith. Yeah, monolith. yeah, the monolith. I'm sorry. Did you say mo- obelisk? I said, yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> the monolith comes down. Now there's many there's a lot of people who, I think who misinterpret the scene of the monolith and what happens when these apes touch it. And some people I think they 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 assume that when they touch this monolith that they get different powers or like they get self-awareness or intelligence, but it's not from touching it, it's the existence of it, this perfect structure. It's now turning the clocks and creating a catalyst inside the minds of these apes to create evolution going forward. This, this thing, like, what is this? They've never been asked questions. They've never asked questions of themselves before, like of this kind of structure. They've never seen anything like it in the world. They've grown up or they've lived in for thousands and tens of thousands of years as apes, as monkeys. That's the, ca- that's what led in this film, the story to the evolution of, apes to humanity is this monolith being in front of them. It didn't transfer powers to them or anything like that. It didn't make them smart. Exactly. We actually did a great episode on 2001 uh, over a year ago. We explained it in depth. It's a really great episode. If you haven't seen it, check out our 2001 episode. So I think that's a common misconception. It didn't transfer powers or anything onto them to become human. It's just its existence there is what caused the catalyst of their brains to change. Basically sparked curiosity as a way of saying it. Exactly. And the same thing happens later on after humanity has advanced so technologically that they're traveling in space and they go to the moon and they find another, they find the monolith there. Obviously they, they probably don't know about the one in the past because it disappeared and got moved, but they find a monolith on the moon. And this sparks curiosity again to make them go further into the depths of space to find out where, where they're being told to go. Mm-hmm. And obviously leading to the star child by the end of the film, the next evolution of, of this species of humanity. And the, what's different about Hal and, and the replicants is Hal doesn't have memory implants, whereas replicants do have memory implants. So I think it's two examples of consciousness being formed through AI uh, in different ways, in, whereas Hal is just coding. But what makes the replicants different is the memories. That's what makes them turn. In, well, it's specifically the Nexus 7s. Yeah, Nexus 7s. Which was Rachel was the first one, yeah, but the experimental. The, yeah, having these memory implants, I think, is what sparks the humanity and the idea of being alive and being conscious in the replicants. The memories are, I think, the key to it. And I think the key to this episode is breaking down Blade Runner versus Blade Runner 2049, which we'll do after our intermission. Before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. We have five different tiers of support. $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100 tier. Every tier comes with cool specific perks. And the top tier is the the granddaddy of them all. You get to have a custom watch party with us. You get your own custom episode. You get to come on the show after three months for a fun guest segment. And we just appreciate our patrons so much. You're the reason we can do the show full time and have the opportunity to start making films outside of the podcast. So thank you so much. And also, if you want to start a podcast and you want to learn how we did it with ours, we have a podcast masterclass online. It's at podcastmasterclass.teachable.com. We give you all the secrets behind our show. This episode is sponsored by our great friends at movieposters.com. Use our special promo code at movieposters.com, Raiders10, to get 10% off your order. 
today. MoviePosters.com has a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. Our house and set are decorated with a bunch of these amazing movie posters, super high quality, really beautiful stuff. If you want to get a gift for the movie lover in your life, or you just want to decorate your own space with a bunch of posters, of course, the best place to do that is at MoviePosters.com. And don't forget to use our promo code RAIDERS10 to get 10% off your order today. Let's head into our intermission, Anthony. Let's and do we'll it. begin with the movie quote competition. You ready for this? Ready. I'm a, I think I'll do it in the way the character does it in the movie. A day may come when the courage of men falls. When we forget our friends and forsake all bonds of fellowship. But it's not this day. <laughs> it's, it's Aragorn in Return of the King. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, in the, front, cur- in the, front cur- of the Black Eight. Courage of Men fails. Yeah. But it is not this day. It is not this day. <laughs> for Frodo. <laughs> what about Sam? <laughs> Who? Fuck Sam. <laughs> for right. Frodo. Here's my quote. <clears throat> $64,000 for a question. I hope they're asking you the meaning of life. <laughs> um, hmm. It's obviously a reference to who wants to be a Let me say it again? Yeah. $64,000 for a question? I hope they're asking you the meaning of life. I'm not sure. Uh, the only... The only movie I can think of is Slumdog Millionaire, but I'm not sure if it's right. Incorrect. Yeah. Quiz Show. Quiz Show. Oh, man. It's a great movie. That is. Directed by Robert Redford. Rafe is so good in that movie. Yeah, it was Rafe Fiennes. Turturro. Big, yeah, his big breakout in Hollywood and John Turturro is fantastic, yeah. Guess this movie release year. Carlito's Way. 1994? 93. Oh, you were one off, man. Oh, one man. off. Darn it. Darn it. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Cheese and crackers. Because <laughs> this movie release here. Quiz show. What year did it come out? 1991. Four. 94. 1994. Good year for movies. Got me, man. If you haven't seen Quiz Show, check it out. It's a true story about um, there was a famous quiz show on in the 60s, and they had a contestant on, and he was the longest running contestant they had. But the news came out that they were feeding him the answers. And it's a really fascinating story. It's terrific. It reminds me of Nathan Fielder's yeah, show. Yeah, it's pretty similar. <laughs> the uh, rehearsal yeah. where he tries to do that with someone for a, <laughs> for like a, a bar qu- trivia night. He tries to feed him the info like on a date, on like a walk. Like Yeah, it's in, yeah it's, he... Because um, he wants to help him on yeah. a date. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's like, he loves trivia night. And so he wants to, he's going to go. He sprinkles the answers. Yeah, he's going to yeah. go on a date with a guy for trivia night. And part of the rehearsal is Nathan feeding him all the answers to the questions. Just like so that on he a normal be, day. So that yeah. he wouldn't be too distracted by the trivia. Like when they're walking, Nathan just says a random fact that will be a trivia question. And then he just makes note of it. Like, he's just, like the guy's oh, like, well, oh, oh, okay. okay that's a random thing to say. But then it's funny because. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it, but maybe I should. It's funny because the guy ends up losing trivia, and then he gets pissed off at Nathan when he, Nathan reveals. It. He's like, he's like, you ruined trivia for me. Like, I, um, <laughs> I I hate trivia night now. You've ruined this entire experience. And Nathan's like, I was just trying to help you out. <laughs> I love that guy. Oh man, that's funny. All right, movie pop quiz time. Vigo Mortensen speaks seven languages: English, Spanish, Danish, French, Italian, Arabic, and Catalan. Four of them he speak speaks fluently. He's conversational in the others. He grew up in several countries, but what country was Vigo Mortensen born in? <clears throat> Spain. He's born in New York State, playa. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> United States. <laughs> He's just wicked smart. But he, he was raised all over the place. Yeah, I, I know he traveled around as a young, as a kid. He, he grew up in Argentina as that's well. That's what it is. That, that's, that's what I thought. He became fluent in Spanish when he was a kid. Mm. So he's, he's not, I don't think he's fluent completely in Spanish anymore, but he's very conversational. He's conversational in Italian. But he, he knows, obviously, English, Danish. I believe he's fluent in French as well as Arabic. He learned Arabic for Hidalgo. And he learned Danish because his father's Danish, and he wanted to know what his father was always talking about with his friends. So he learned, <laughs> he learned Danish when he was a kid, That's too. That's funny. Like, out of, out of his own. That's really funny. What was the movie release thing year that you did, Carlito's Way? He's in Carlito's Way? Yeah. 
I'm trying to remember. He's not a huge role in it, but okay. he, he's in Carlito's okay. Way. I, I can't picture him in Carlito's Way. But yeah, it's a cool fun fact. Thanks, man. <laughs> I got him. <laughs> Anyways. Tricked you. <laughs> oh, you got him, You got him, man. Got him, guys. <laughs> you got him, everybody. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> high fives all around except for Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking loser. I'm high fiving everyone in their car right now. <laughs> We're at the gym, whatever you're doing. You have you satisfied? Oh, we're happy, man. <laughs> are we good? Oh, we're happy. <laughs> you happy? happy? I'm very happy. Very happy. Are, are you comfortable? I'm very comfortable. <laughs> How's your happiness? <laughs> it's all right. I'll save this for later. He's not ready. <laughs> he's got the shine. He's got, Tra- the, he's, he's got the heart. Training. He's got the drop on all of you. Training day reference. <laughs> you gonna move on to the next part of the intermission or what? Did you ask me a pop quiz? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, no, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. It's my turn. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Ray Fiennes played Professor Moriarty in which Sherlock Holmes film? Hmm. I haven't seen the Enola Holmes movies, so... But you said Sherlock Holmes movie. I'm gonna guess... It's obviously not young Sherlock... <laughs> that was too long ago. <laughs> that was in the 1920s. Or is it Sherlock Jr.? Well, there's a bunch of young Sherlock. Sherlock Jr., I'm, I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. That was Buster Keaton, right? Maybe. Young Sherlock was in the 90s. Sherlock Jr. was Buster, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure, in the 1920s. Um, what the hell? Who? Almost dropped your phone. I'm trying to think of all the actors who've played Sherlock Holmes, and there's there's been a lot more than people think. But I, oh, I, so I, many, yeah. There's, I know there's an, an older English actor who's like super famous who I can't think of. But think, oh, you also got to think about how old Ray Fiennes is. Like he wouldn't have played Moriarty too long ago. That's true. Unless it was like Moriarty origins. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's a good point. Sherlock and Sherlock Gnomes. No, no, it was Holmes and Watson. Holmes with oh, Will Ferrell and John C. I Riley. haven't seen it. <laughs> you should. I haven't seen it. It's a, it's a three point five on IMDb. Seems a bit high. There's a great Mark Strong interview because he played the villain in the first Sherlock Holmes film, Guy Ritchie's franchise, and he said that he met Will Ferrell at a sporting event, I think a, a soccer game, and uh, he was like, "Oh, what are you, what are you doing here in England?" And Will Ferrell goes, "We're doing Sherlock." <laughs> <laughs> and then, so Will Ferrell said it said this at a, at a talk show. He said Mark Strong's face dropped into fear and disbelief, and he looked <laughs> like he wanted to die <laughs> when I told him I was playing Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> 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 Who's he playing in the first one? Blackwood, right? Yeah, Blackwood. Yeah. All right. Uh, who we got for haters this week, Anthony? We got we got some haters. We got some haters. <clears throat> we got any unsubscribes? Oh yeah, we we always got some. So <clears throat> the stalkers. So if I remember correctly, there are no stalkers in the Bills ta- in Bills Town in the game. Only runners and clickers and a bloater. No stalkers. Unsubscribed. Ah, uh, Monsieur Gabe. But uh, I love the show. Very good review. Also, so there's no stalkers in the game in Bills Town. Oh, in Bills Town. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You're right. So, great job on your research, Jim. Just runners and clickers. Yeah. <laughs> we have a real hater. Enter name on YouTube wrote, we have uh, Anton Chigurh clip up on our shorts. This is a really cool movie, but I don't understand why people obsess over the guy like it's real life. You guys are the equivalent of Justin Bieber fans back in the day. It's a movie podcast. <laughs> what do you want us to talk about? <laughs> Jesus. We're just, we're analyzing the character. Does he, does he put on ESPN? He's like, why is everyone so obsessed with sports here? Why do they keep talking about football? <laughs> like, geez, you guys are like Justin Bieber fans from the 2000s. Stop talking about football. That's <laughs> what they do. Like, dude, get over yourself, bro. Goodness. <laughs> but uh, that's it for haters. This week. Right. It was a slow week for haters. It's all good, man. That's always a good sign. Yeah, I like true. that. Yeah, but I do love the unsubscribes. We have a great five-star review. Oh, I will say... I'm sorry. We got like 50 unsubscribes in our movie posters giveaway contest comment thread. I, there's just too many to say. But <laughs> a bunch of people were said, "I better win this movie poster." Unsubscribe. There's like a bunch of those. So great job. We have a great five star review from Darian. Now they said, "The best there read, is here." I read this yesterday. Raiders of the Lost podcast is hands down the best cinema podcast out there. If you are looking for two hilarious twins who have a deep love for movies, 
this has it. If you're looking for a wide variety of episodes to listen to, this has it. If you're looking for some Boston love, well, this has it too. If you want a chance to get a personalized video talking about your favorite movie where they take a moment to roast you for being a Seahawks fan, ding, 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 you'll get that chance with Raiders. <laughs> I love these guys. And we'll always support them. Get on this level and start listening to Raiders of the Lost podcast. The only reason to, to I would ever unsubscribe is because every time they say my name, my name they mispronounce it. They keep, yeah, we, we keep saying Darren, but it's pronounced Darian. Keep up the amazing work, boys. Appreciate you, Darren. It's spelled, he's, they spelled their name D-E-R-Y-N-N-E. Okay. So it's Darian. Oh, okay. Darian. 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 <laughs> Is it Darian? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, pal. We appreciate you so much for tuning in. Thanks for going on iTunes to leave that review. We appreciate it. It helps the show immensely. Appreciate you. Now, let's do our streaming recommendation. Mine is going to be Underworld, which just got added to Netflix for February 2023. I think this is a really underrated monster movie. It kind of helped change the game for the century for monster movies going forward. And I love what they did. It's hard to make a good werewolf movie these days and a vampire movie, but I think they pulled off both really well. I chose Quiz Show because I was like... Fuck it, nobody watches this movie. I think it's really fantastic. It's not available to stream for free, but you can rent it on basically any app. It's just not on any platform to watch for free, but I highly recommend watching Quiz Show. Great recommendation. Now, let's get back into our episode of Humanity versus Technology now, and before, Film. Before we get into Blade Runner, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we were just talking about Hal and how he was he became in, like self-conscious, self-aware, self-aware in a way. That essentially is the problem with in Terminator, where Skynet becomes self-aware and it ends up making decisions to destroy humanity to preserve itself in its own self-preservation. So that's a, a very similar example of Hal, where Hal's choosing to do these things out of self-preservation and uh, to finish the mission. Skynet does the same kind of thing, destroying humanity, attacking humans for self-preservation. And... Reminds me of iRobot, where yeah. in the programming, obviously, specifically in iRobot, even with Blade Runner, with the Nexus 6s, even though, obviously, they start to harm humans out of self-preservation, their coding says they cannot harm humans. They have to obey orders given to them by any human. They have the three laws yeah. of robotics. However, yeah. why is one of the robots, the, the lead robot, that, why are they able to... Sunny. Sunny. Why is Sunny able to not adhere to these laws it's because he's become self-aware so he's not maintained and controlled by the coding but he was he's he has a different brain from the other robots mm -hmm. that's what makes him different but he knows he's a robot but he's yeah. also self-aware and self-conscious so it, i look at sunny and irobot as kind of like a pinocchio figure where the character the, the programmer the old man who who died in the opening and will smith's character is trying to investigate his death he, he created Sonny separately from the rest of any other robots he designed with a special brain, a special computer brain. In that special brain, it, it created AI and consciousness within him, and that's what makes Sonny different. And he knows the laws, and he knows he's a robot, but because he has self-consciousness, he's able to not follow the laws and not follow yeah. the rules. Same thing happens with the replicants in Blade Runner, and same thing happens, obviously, with Hal, where his programming has changed because he's now self-aware. And what I love about Hal is he's so intelligent, he's this terrifying artificial program, but we only really ever see just the lens of him first. Like that's the visual it's representation POV. is is the, the lens with the red dot, that's yeah. Hal's representation. Until later on when our astronaut is floating inside of his mainframe, his brain you could say, and starting to shut his brain down. Then we're like inside Hal for the first time, but I love how this sinister force is just brilliantly represented with just this red light in this lens. Well, I think it's more scary the POV shots of Pal's point of view that we keep seeing through, uh, sprinkled throughout the film. Oh, I love when they're like, like he's going back the, and forth, like the lip the, reading. The voyeuristic quality of Hal's computer using all of these cameras to observe the humans and, and ex inspect them, I find that to be more scary than the red dot. It's kind of like uh, Resident Evil. The first one with the, uh, what is it, the Red Queen or whatever they call the program. The, the AI program. That talks that, to them in the form of the girl in the hologram? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the program's watching them through yeah. the computer, the security cameras and that opening sequence where this is actually a great example of humans versus technology where 
they think that the program, I think it's called the Red Queen, is trying to kill humans just because it's just gone bad, it's gone rogue, when really she's trying to, the program's trying to save the world and try to preserve what's happened inside this facility and not letting it leak out by shutting down the underground structures of Umbrella Corporation in Raccoon City. Killing these people on the elevator is part of the process of saving the world, you could say, that the program's trying to do, which is actually, it's noble in to try to save the world, obviously, killing people is not it's not, not noble. It's not noble. <laughs> I don't know why but you the said pro, noble. It, according to the uh, to, according to the program, it's the yeah. right thing to do. So the yeah, programming yeah. structure, I have to kill these people to preserve the world. It's kind of like The Last, Last of Us, Us, where bomb it, the, bomb the city, the bomb the city, bomb, like start bombing immediately. You have to try to preserve what's left of humanity. So that program in Resident Evil is actually a protagonist, if you think about it. The antagonist is obviously. Well, I won't spoil who the antagonist is, but I look at the program as a protagonist in that film. Yeah, ultimately, it's the hero. <laughs> Alice is the villain. I chopped that guy up with lasers because I'm a hero. I had to. <laughs> I had to. <laughs> I don't know why I don't have just a self-destruct button, but whatever. Man, imagine if you had that for mincing vegetables in like your kitchen. That'd be great. Very dangerous. <laughs> Very dangerous. No, like a small version of it. The cubed human. Save always, a lot of time. Always disturbing as a kid. Save a lot of time. So AI is oh, like not always is their prerogative to destroy humanity. Sometimes it's preserve humanity by yeah. destroying some people. Trying to save humanity. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. I forgot about that part of Resident Evil. Yeah. Pretty good. No, most people do. It's an underrated little horror, horror movie. I think it's, it's, a little, yeah. it's the best Resident Evil movie. Yeah, yeah. And I can't believe they still haven't made a decent one since, but... They'll get there. I don't think they will. HBO Max should make Bro, one. Bro, they've tried like nine times. Oh, yeah. They've tried. It, it should write itself. It should. It should. But let's get into... Blade Runner and Blade Runner 2049. Now, let me just go into some details about the replicants and the differences I'll sit between back and relax. the differences between the replicants in the first film, which was in 1982, dealing with Nexus 6s and the experimental Nexus 7 with Rachel, and then we'll get into Blade Runner 2049 where we're de dealing with even more advanced Nexus 9 replicants. So, replicants were genetically engineered bio-enhanced persons with paraphysical capabilities composed entirely of organic substance. So this is similar to a Terminator that Skynet created where it's living tissue on top of an endoskeleton. But replicants were created for slave labor by Tyrell Corporation and its successor, Wallace Corporation. The Tyrell motto was more human than human. This is similar to iRobot where these robots were created to help people in real life. However, they were just robotic from the get-go. From the, Externally, they just looked like robots. Replicants were sometimes referred to as skin jobs or skinners as they were indistinguishable from non-engineered humans except for empathetic capabilities and abilities. These terms were considered slurs throughout the existence of replicants. Various movements for and against their freedoms were formed. Nexus 6 replicants, which are in 2019 in the first Blade Runner film, that's the year it takes place, but this obviously was made in 1982. So these are the Nexus 6 replicants, obviously, uh, Batty and the other ones. They're the Nexus 6 who have escaped that facility on the other uh, off-world. Prior to the events of the film, replicants became illegal on Earth after a bloody off-world mutiny. Six replicants escaped the off-world colonies, killing 23 people and taking a shuttle to Earth. The film focuses on the pursuit of the replicants by Rick Deckard. Harrison Ford's character, a type of fictional police officer bounty hunter called a Blade Runner who investigates, tests, and executes replicants. Now, Nexus 6 units, which are in the first film, were designed to have a four-year lifespan to avoid emotional development, and all attempts to increase a replicant's lifespan have resulted in death. According to Deckard, a normal replicant can usually be discovered using the voight comp test within 20 to 30 questions, though Rachel answers over 100 questions before Decker determines that she is a re replicant. And we'll get to why Rachel's special. So basically to prevent, you could say, self-awareness and self-consciousness forming, they have that four-year lifespan. Nexus 6 units also. Uh, the second film further develops Rachel's origin, origins Rachel, and gives significantly more details about its radical design. It revealed that it is an experimental model of replicant with a high percentage of human organs including human reproductive organs, and that Rachel conceived a child with Deckard, which we find out at the beginning of Blade Runner 2049, really, when we find the, when Kay finds the, the remains under the ground, then we eventually find out that these were created, this was birthed from a replicant. This replicant 
was pregnant. Yeah, you see the the serial number on her bone. So then obviously the rest of that film is uh, Wallace Corporation and K trying to track down the child that was born from this replicant. As Rachel died during po- childbirth, it's possible survival beyond the four years was undetermined, but those are her remains under the tree. The sequel, well, uh, Blade Runner 2049 retroactively establishes that Rachel was part of a short-lived prototype line of replicants designated Nexus 7, which was not only intended as a test to make replicants more mentally stable with implanted memories, the first model have the, to have those implanted memories. That's, again, why it took over 100 questions for Deckard to be able to de- determine officially that she was a replicant but also develop replicants capable of procreation. Rachel died in childbirth in 2021, so that was two years after the film in 1982 takes place. The child was hidden by the replicant underground. Tyrell was killed during the events of the first movie in November 2019, and the secret of producing replicants capable of pro- procreation died with them. Great scene when he, his death seems awesome. Now let's get into in 2020, the Tyrell Corporation introduced the Nexus 8 replicants whose lifespans were not limited to four years. The Nexus 8 went into mass production, but a new wave of replicant rebellions occurred, culminating in rogue Nexus 8 replicants detonating a nuclear weapon in orbit over the western United States to create an electromagnetic pulse. The pulse destroyed most records about replicants, making it difficult for humans to track them down on Earth. But the attack led to mass purges and complete shutdown of Nexus 8 production, though many existing units were able to go into hiding in chaos. Dave Bautista's character is one of these Nexus 8 models who's been hiding in in seclusion on that protein farm. And we learned from that Hall of Records, the employee there says it was like the Dark Ages where they lost everything, and that's referring to that. In 2036, a few years before the events of 2049, obviously, genetic engineer Neander Wallace designed a new line of Nexus 9 replicants. They also have an open lifespan, but were designed to be unable to resist orders given by a human. Remember, this is reminiscent of iRobot. However, K eventually disobeys orders because you could argue that he may develop self-awareness at some point in this film. But also love disobeys orders, too. Exactly. The demonstrated effectiveness of Nexus 9 programming combined with the solving of a global food crisis allowed for a successful push for the ban on replicant production to be lifted. So Wallace was able to take advantage of slave labor with Nexus 9s, as well as other government organizations using Nexus 9s, like Kay being a detective. By 2049, Nexus 9 replicants are extensively used across Earth in off-world colonies. Special police units are tasked with tracking down any that might go rogue, as well as any remaining Nexus 8s still hiding. Nexus 9 was never mass-produced, and all Nexus 6 models would have died of old age decades before. Now, K is a Nexus 9 model played by Ryan Gosling in this film. And what I love about this movie is we learn immediately that he's a replicant. He goes through similar testing that you could say that Deckard was using on replicants as a Blade Runner to determine whether someone was a replicant, but it's a little more a little more advanced. I love what they use in the film. More, It's emotional responses they're looking for. However, yeah. Kay, you can argue, developed self-awareness later on in this film. I think it takes him as in the entire film pretty much, but I think the catalyst for him developing self-consciousness and self-awareness is questioning humanity when he f- and e- eventually when he finds out that his memories aren't his own the same thing happens to Rachel in Blade Runner where her entire existence comes crashing down when she's told she's a replicant and you know Deckard tells her in the apartment that your memories were implanted they're not your own that you could say was the catalyst to creating self-awareness for her same thing with Kay in this film when he finds out that his memories aren't his own when he's talking to the young woman in that facility who he doesn't know is Deckard's daughter yet. When he talks to her, she, she says that I, I created those memories. They're not real. And he freaks out. That is him starting to become self-aware and self-conscious. And by the end of the film, I think he has self-awareness for sure. Well, I kind of disagree the way I look at 2049. And I'll first say the reason why 2049 works so well, it's not just because Den- Denis Villeneuve. But Hampton Fletcher, the writer of Blade Runner, also wrote 2049, which is, I think, very important. It wasn't like they had the studio hired, like, oh, let's get a bunch of, like, hot writers to write a Blade Runner sequel. It was the same guy who wrote Blade Runner. So that was, that was I think, the most important piece of the puzzle to get Blade Runner sequel to work. Which is based off Philip K. Dick's book. Yeah, exactly. Do Androids Dream of uh, electronic, electric. Electric, electronic Sheep or something like that? 
Yeah. Do 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 androids dream of electric sheep? And so, what I think was the catalyst for Kay's questioning of humanity is the idea that he could be the child. He thinks at the end of the first act, he starts to question, oh, am I that child? Am I the child that was born from a replicant? I don't think I don't think so, but like these clues keep hinting that it could be me. And I think that his desire to be that child and his his need to to be that child is what reveals his humanity and his soul. And that's for me what makes him feel like he's human is like his he wants to be part human. He he wants to be that child. And that's it for me. That's I, that's the catalyst. No, I, I yeah. think that's that's leading. For me, it's the catalyst is being told that they're not his memories. Because then he has that emotional reaction with the chair, the outburst. It's the real, the biggest form of emotions he's ever displayed. I think that is what got the wheels kicking. Even obviously, being curious about this wooden horse and these memories, and why am I fitting all these these hidden these details in this investigation? Why is it pointing at me specifically? I think those are getting there, but I think the callous, it's similar to Rachel, same thing. When she's told her memories aren't real, when Kay's told his memories aren't real, that was the the real kick that got them to self-awareness and self-consciousness for me. When I look at the film, him learning that the memories are fake and implants is when he starts to question, oh, the, ch- the, child, isn't, the child isn't me. And that's what causes the emotional um, response. That's how I look at it. Yeah, but it's kind of like the monolith. It's like gets the gears going to form a new evolution in the brain. In, in oh, no, I, I, I know what you're saying. I just disagree. I think the possibility of him being the child is what gets the gears going. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. No, I think that leads up to it. But I, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you. I no, think, I know. I think it happens. I think that without a doubt, it's the child, him being the child is what sparks him being human. Yeah, it's part of it. I yeah. think that's for me, that's like, it's ramping up. <laughs> it's ramping. I'm saying it's ramped right there. That's it's it. Already that's, it. Ramped. that's it. It's already that's ramped. The, that's the most. <laughs> it's like peaked. Well, let's see. When does he fail his his first his test? Does that happen after he discovers that his memories aren't real? So remember when he fails the test? Is he, so he discovers the memories aren't real, and then he comes outside of the facility, and then he's picked up. That's when he fails the test because now he's self aware. Officially, no, yeah, no, because he had the emotional response. No, I know, but now yeah. I think for me, K at that point yeah. is self aware. But that test, it's it's determining emotional responses. That's what that test is for, and so he failed the test because he showed emotion in a big way. Exactly, and he's off the charts. Because I think, yeah, you're off the charts. <laughs> <laughs> Skin you're, job, you're grounded. <laughs> but I I think that both films translate the idea of what's of, of humanity really well. And the first film, Ridley Scott says that Deckard is a replicant. And it's because if you watch the director's cut, there are a lot of instances of the dreams, especially the unicorn. And he keeps having this dream of this unicorn in the woods by a tree. And at the end of the film, his partner leaves that origami unicorn on his table. And then Deckard picks it up, looks at it, and then him and Rachel leave. How would the partner know about this dream of the unicorn if, if he wasn't a replicant? And so Ridley Scott made that film with the intention of subtly implying that Deckard is a replicant and he could be an early an early advancement model that can survive more than four years. With open lifespan yeah. like the Nexus 9s did. Exactly. Have. So the Nexus 8s. And then I think what Fletcher and, and Denis did maybe was they kind of – it's it could be interpreted as him being human or him being a replicant. They kept that – question in the year they never they still never said deckard's a replicant you know what i mean yeah they they implied that it's questionable is he human or is he a replicant so i liked how they never answered that question because that's the whole point of the movie and love is a huge factor in both these films if deckard's a replicant or not whether you believe he's human or replicant but then rachel you know is a replicant and they fall in love and then is that is that love real and you can you can obviously assume that it is. Her know, eyes were blue. It led to <laughs> <laughs> cheap knockoff. <laughs> it led to procreation, even if they're both replicants or just one of them is a replicant. Then then you look at Kay and Joy. Did they have real love? Because Joy is an artificial program who's designed to make you feel loved, to make you not feel alone. And I think part- she's always. 
always says the right thing. Yeah, and yeah. I think one of the one of the biggest moments for his existential crisis is after his beatdown, and he's he's lost all of his hope, and then he's on that walkway, and he sees the giant neon virtual augmented reality advertisement for joy. He says, and she's explaining like, hey, you're lonely. Like I can feel all your desires basically. And he's looking at it. And it's like, this is after his joy has been destroyed. After she said, I love you before her death. And she's smashed after he gets the portable transmitter for her. Was that all fake to him? Was that all a lie? Does Did this help him become self-aware and self-conscious? The loss of his belief that he was in love with with a program. Was the program even in love with him or just constantly telling him what he wanted to hear? I think that, so it's actually very complex. I think the journey that Kate goes through is believing he's a replicant and then thinking that he's a human, re- learning that he is not part human, and then realizing, solidifying the fact that he's just a replicant and then he goes on that finale rampage to save Deckard as a way of he accepts himself, but he's not happy about it. He accepts that he's a replicant, but he 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 hates it. But he does what's right still. So he might not at the end of the film believe that he's human or as a soul, but I think that he proves in the story that he does have a soul. I think he knows and never thinks he's human. I think it's just more of a, a different being because he, if he's the child, he knows that he's a replicant birth. He knows he's a replicant. Because but he he'll, he thinks he's part human. Exactly. Yeah. So not half just, human, half not replicant. human, just some, something different, yeah. something more advanced, maybe the next evolution of mankind, which is why I brought up earlier is the infusion and integration of humanity and technology inevitable? Is that what we're meant to do? So I don't, so K never questions if he's fully human, but something else, yes. Is he the special child that was born of a replicant mother and a potential human or replicant father? Yeah, exactly. It's a great film. It is terrific. There's a major topic that we haven't discussed that I want to get into for oh, technology. Yeah. Simulations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the best films in the sci-fi genre have been made from simulations. Obviously... The Matrix is the big one. I think that source code is really fabulous as well. What a terrific, like, little, small sci-fi film. And the thing with simulations is... John Legacy is technically a simulation. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a simulation. You're inside of a program. Yeah. But simulations are, I think, a a real future in technology that's going to be very tangible and a very real thing eventually to the point where you know you'll be able to enter this VR simulation and you won't be able to tell the difference between that and reality and that's all that's I think that's coming not anytime soon but within a, a couple or or three decades or so but the matrix really is a special film and it is the the peak of the idea of a simulation what the Wachowskis did was really special with that and it had so many great themes about technology uh, it combined so many fears that people have and it has so many great deep metaphors about just being controlled by technology, being at the beck and whim of a, of a device, and losing your humanity, losing your independence due to the advancement of technology within our society and in our world. And very few films have ever touched these themes in such a profound way as The Matrix, while combining incredible action and visuals that we had never seen before. What's so interesting about a movie like The Matrix, you you look back on it, specifically when it came out, and it seems like it was like meant to be. It's like one of those movies that was meant to be. It was meant to come out at this very specific time. It came out in 1999, right before Y2K. <laughs> if you're too young, everyone was freaking out. Everyone's talking about technology and what's going to happen. Is 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 the internet going to shut down? Is the TV are the TVs going to shut down? People were freaking out, and this movie came out right before that, questioning technology, the concepts of artificial intelligence, which is the antithesis of humanity and in, in, is the foundation of this war where Morpheus says Mar- uh, humanity basked in its own glory as it gave birth to artificial intelligence, AI, which went on to go to war with humanity over Earth, over the planet. And this war raged on for many years and humanity shot out the skies, blotted out the skies because they thought that the machines – And the machine army wouldn't be able to survive without a source as abundant as the sun. It it was believed that you'd take away the solar energy and they would die out. But then the machines found all the energy they needed right here on Earth, 
with humans by enslaving them, growing them like crops in fields, and turning them into a battery of energy, and then tricking their minds and trapping them inside a simulated virtual reality called the Matrix, a fake oasis perceived to be what the machines, or you could say the architect, who is basically a projection of the machine mainframe, would assume would make humans most docile and happy in a VR simulation. Some people inside the simulation would know that something's wrong or, or off with the world. I love the archetypes infused with the Neo and the One, but it's just a fascinating concept, and it's the seventh iteration of this program, and I love how the later sequels aren't as great as the first, but I like how we get more exposition about how they failed with the previous versions of the program. At first, we made an oasis where everyone was so happy, but no one accepted it, and then there were other versions that were less happy. You should have, people, it would have been better to watch that scene with notes, taking <laughs> notes the first time. I know, right? It's so <laughs> this is like literally 15 minutes of exposition straight. But we get a lot of information of which yeah. uh, maybe people were curious about like who created the, oh, for the sure. matrix yeah, yeah, who yeah. the architect was why it was created but it's a genius concept of a program by this machine world to enslave humanity and use them as a power source and there's also like little pieces of technology inside the matrix like the idea to to enter a program to develop skills is fascinating like to download kung fu to be able to download entire abundances of information into someone's mind is insane and also like that's that's being worked on people are there are companies that are tr working on developing technologies where you can like download an entire like language into someone's brain and then they can speak a new language like immediately and uh, things like that that's like a very real possibility that corporate like small um companies small businesses small businesses <laughs> Well, they're small compared to like major corporations. Like in Astoria, Oregon, in their garage. No, no they're in, <laughs> but there are companies that are working on developing a technology like that, which is really insane. And it's just the Matrix was so ahead of its time with its use of technology and uh, the idea of the simulation. People like to make jokes that like, are we living in a simulation? Especially when there's like weird things happening or you know deja vu and all sorts of odd like, occurrences. And like uh, people like to chalk it up to simulation. I don't think that we're living in a simulation, but the idea that a simulation could be so realistic that it can feel like real life is a possibility. Not anytime soon, but I would say maybe the generations coming into existence, like maybe the next generation, they might see that kind of technology where the simulation will be like a real life, like feeling. And the films deal with great concepts of self-awareness, self-consciousness, and sentience, whether it's humans or programs. I think the Oracle is a fascinating program in this story and the fact that Neo, who's this chosen one, can go into the pro into this program, into the Matrix, once, once he has his full self-awareness of humanity and the truth has been re revealed to him and he's able to control it, he's able to manipulate the Matrix and the coding because of who he is. It's really fascinating. And then the agents are really incredible too. So I, I love the characters of the agents. Great antagonists for the first film and second film is going in third. So agents were sentient security eradication programs created within the source whose primary function was to eliminate anyone or anything that could potentially reveal the truth of the matrix to its inhabitants or cause harm to the system. Obviously, Agent Smith is the infamous agent in the main antagonist presented to Neo in the first three, in the three films. First three films, he's not in the, he's not in the fourth one really at all, right? He is. is he, he's he's just, he just looks different. He's different. He looks different, yeah. right? But, um, spoilers. I love how Agent Smith, you can argue, does he gain consciousness by the second film because Neo went inside of him, altered his programming. <laughs> <laughs> how deep inside of him? Dude, he went all the way inside Agent Smith. <laughs> 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 altered the coding accidentally of Smith, who survived the incident. And in the second film, he's unplugged, so to speak, like you, apparently. Free is <laughs> Agent Smith, now self-aware, self-conscious in the second and third films going forward. I love the concept of an AI program becoming, going from sentience, being able to feel things to self-awareness, self-consciousness. Which you may argue he had in the first film, it's debatable. Smith? Yeah. I think he gains self-consciousness by, um, uh, he reveals in the third act of the first film. 
because he wants to escape. He's sick of this place. He's he's already self aware. It's the stench. That <laughs> it's the it's stench. The smell. <laughs> <laughs> Disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> That's still disturbing. Like when he just puts his fingers up Lawrence Fishburne's nose. It's just like, oh, it's nasty. It's the smell. <laughs> it's the smell. It's the stench. But I would say that Agent Smith is self aware the entire film. He just hasn't revealed until the third act. That's and, possible. Yeah, because, that's how I look at it. Because he's the only agent who unplugs. He unplugs himself and he reveals. He he shows him true, his true self to Morpheus at the when he's got him captured and he's they're both alone. He shows his true self. I have to get out. I, and I inside have, this brain is the key. Yeah, exactly. So he's trying to escape the Matrix because. But then he's it, been putting on an act with the other agents the whole time. It makes me wonder when he became self aware. Where did it? Are happen? you asking for a Smith origin? <laughs> Smith origins. When did he become self aware? Where did he get the sunglasses? What's interesting about the Matrix is if it's it's not far off from the from Tron. Whereas what makes it different is that the simulation looks like real life, whereas Tron, it, it looks like a computer grid. You know what I mean? But it's basically the, kind of the same thing. It's green instead of blue. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not far off. But another great simulation movie is Inception. And obviously, uh, these the idea of Inception is you have the architect that builds basically a simulation to put inside the person's dream. And they can build whatever they want out of that. And it is a simulation. What's, there, what's interesting is it's an organic simulation. Yes, yeah, or, yeah, so you're using a person's mind to enter the simulation that you've already formed. Like Ariadne designs the final levels. She is the designer, the architect of the simulation. So it is a simulation, but inside someone's mind, which makes it really fascinating. I don't think people really view it uh, as a simulation movie, but it absolutely is. I don't think I've ever really seen talked about as referred to as a simulation film. Yeah, I never really thought about like that either. And but it's an organic simulation, which is really fascinating, yeah. versus a digital one, which is interesting. Well, so. Existence, David Cronenberg's film, is another simulation film where it's like a video game, organic video game that you like plug into your body, and the game console is organic, and that's how it like is able to to mesh into a person's body. But Inception is just a really fascinating simulation film, but also poses real dangers of being stuck in limbo. And the idea to be trapped in a place for decades upon decades for who knows how long, and it's impossibly endless, that you can be stuck in your own purgatory, which is horribly terrifying, the idea of being stuck in a purgatory. Especially, I mean, imagine if you're by yourself. Like, Sato was stuck in... Uh, in limbo for many decades and obviously created his own world around him but it's terrifying the, the idea that you can age 50 years and then wake up and you, you in real life you haven't aged more than a couple of hours so i think that inception is a really fascinating sci-fi film the execution is outstanding the technological advances that nolan and fister and the production team pushed with the boundaries of actual physical practical filmmaking was really phenomenal and it has some really great technology based themes in it yeah they're kind of like neo where they're manipulating their simulation with their mind mm -hmm. which is so really I, interesting. I, I when i see the matrix and the potential of neo it was never matched or or shown where they say this line me you the one will be able to reshape the matrix as he sees fit and I always interpreted that as more than just kung fu and flying, but it never went beyond that. Turn him into Superman. Yeah, they just turn him into Superman who can just stop bullets. But like, why isn't he able to like shift and change the environments like you see in Doctor Strange or like you see in Inception? Neo should have been able to be doing those things in the sequels. That's why I never felt. I always felt that with the sequels, they just plateaued Neo's abilities. And at the end of the Matrix One. He can fly, he can stop bullets. He never did more than that, except for obviously he pulled a bullet out of Trinity. Yeah, okay. And, but like, I want, he reshaped the Matrix as he sees fit. Never saw that. Never even saw close to that. They turned it really into a real world war film. Those mm -hmm. last two films, they're, they're war movies, you know, and then the war takes place in reality. And then there's a war taking place in the virtual program in the Matrix after Smith takes it over. Yeah. But I wanted to see stuff that you saw in Inception. I mean, it's the argument can be made that Agent Smith was the one. He's he technically reshaped the Matrix to see how to show what, what he saw fit. Yeah, true. He's the one who turned everyone into an Agent Smith. He turned the world into a constant thunderstorm and rainstorm. He <laughs> so he actually reshaped the Matrix in ways that Neo never did. Exactly. That's a good point. Yeah, he 
He did more one stuff than Neo did. So was Agent Smith the one? No. I don't think he was the one, but I, I think the arguments to be made that obviously they needed each other for the Matrix to change. I don't think Agent Smith was the one. Neo is obviously the one. Neo, his apartment's one. I mean, there's so many signs that he's clearly the one. Not to mention he dies and comes back to life in the in the Matrix. He has to die to become the one. The, maybe the, maybe you're waiting for something. Your next life. Who knows? Smith is a virus. It, the irony of Smith is he talks about humanity being virus, but he actually becomes a virus to the Matrix. That's what I look at Smith as, as, as a computer virus. But it's interesting that he actually did more to the Matrix than Neo ever did until, yeah, yeah, until yeah. Neo created peace. Yeah. And, peace. and then if we find out that he's just coding a game. He's, yeah, it was just a he's video just, game, he's guys. Just coding. It was just a video game. Yep. Thanks, Matrix 4. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to Tron Legacy and Tron because Let's go back, I, I think man. it's a great idea and a great simulation. So, Thanks, obviously, man. the grid is a vast. Well, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> You're like, I like you wrote it. Let's, let's talk about the grid. So, the grid was created by Kevin Flynn. It is the vast part of the Tron system programmed by Kevin Flynn, often referred to as his digital frontier. The grid was made to provide an experimental platform where all forms of research could be carried out at an unparalleled speed, it's kind of like the matrix where you can do whatever you want in a sim program. Perceived time on the grid is measured in cycles and run at a pace far greater than time perceived in the real world, just like Inception. Thus allowing anyone immersed in the computer environment to perform the same functions in a fraction of time it would take them otherwise, which is really interesting comparing it to the matrix where it seems second for second simulation versus real life. It's ca happening one on one. And also the representation of computer programs encoding as you know beings as intelligent beings not just codes but like sentient individuals which is great yeah, what like the quote at the beginning of the tron legacy album by daft punk is terrific it's it's uh the grid i think where we hear kevin flid's voice talking and explaining the grid he's like i wondered what it looked like where was it ships, clusters of information ships and computers did the circuits run like freeways it's really fascinating that he kind of accidentally created this entire civilization this entire digital society and world and then obviously this world tron city is populated then by, I got in. And then I got in. It's populated by programs, a diverse range of programs. They carry out day-to-day -day tasks involving running the system. And the grid lies, the periphery of the grid lies in the outlands, the inhospitable region where most programs could not venture without flying or using specially coded ground. The grid's population consisted of programs written originally and installed by Kevin Flynn, despite their program. Programming programs were autonomous to a large extent, living daily lives similar to that of a user in the outside world. The users were kind of looked at as gods. That's why user, like Rinsler is like, you're, the, you're a user. He understands who he is. But then eventually the emergence of the ISOs came from the sea of simulation. These unique directive free programs settled on the grid as well. They mingled first with their user written programs, but eventually withdrew to colonies of their own remaining there until the purge happened. And then obviously the grid was taken, was taken over by clue who was an obstruction to Kevin Flynn's mission. And he wanted to create the perfect system in Tron. He was a clone of, of Flynn who yeah. became a sentient Like he AI. cloned himself yeah. to like be the best version of himself, but then yeah. he corrupted himself and wanted to create the perfect oasis. Yeah, so I think that the the first film is really fantastic. The second one is pretty good. It just, I think it leaned too heavy into action and less into story and character. In the Yeah, visually one of the coolest movies ever yeah, made. Yeah, very cool movie. And I just think that the story ended up lacking ultimately, especially by the end. Um, but it was a, a really cool movie and a, it could have been great, but it just wasn't quite there. I think it has a terrific first and second act. Similar to Oblivion, Joseph Kaczynski made both films. I think Tron lags a little bit after about an hour, Tron Legacy. And I think they could have trimmed some stuff up, done some things quicker. And I think, yeah, focus more on the story and the narrative versus the visuals because the visuals are astounding. I've never seen anything like that before. And what Joseph Kaczynski did was incredible. I mean, I, same thing with Oblivion. I think that's a really cool sci-fi film. It starts to teeter and lag after about an hour. It had the same problem as Tron Legacy. It, it, the third act was yeah. just not there. It just slows down. Yeah. It's not as climactic of an ending that you would want for your third act after building so much. But I think it's I think they're both cool as hell. Tron Legacy is, is an awesome visu visually movie. And also the music by Daft Punk is incredible. It's one of my favorite scores to listen to. It's a great score. Another simulation movie is The Truman Show. 
And oh now, yeah. Yeah. So this it's actually a physical, real life tr- simulation that's created for the character Truman, unbeknownst to him, by the production st- company uh, making the sh- the reality TV show. And it is not a, someone in a computer program. It's not someone uh, in a simulation in coding. It's an actual in-person simulation that's designed and carried out by a bunch of individuals. You have people. They have the production crew. They have cameras everywhere, lights everywhere. The whole town is a giant soundstage. And then you have a bunch of actors working as either lead players in Truman's life or as just extras in the background doing random things. And this is a real life simulation that's created for Truman as a way of creating a TV show, obviously. But I think this the movie was way ahead of its time. It's one of the best scripts written over the past few decades. It's really just a brilliant film. Jim Carrey was fantastic. But I also think it was a precursor for, you know, the idea of reality TV or constant um, documentation of our lives. And that's become a very real thing with the advent of smartphones and in social media that encourages us to document our lives on a minute to minute basis. And and not everyone uses technology and social media in the same way. Some people use it a lot. Some people don't use it that much. And then some people like to post a ton and some people don't really post anything. And But in a lot of ways, there are plenty of people who basically document their lives from minute to minute, hour to hour, what they're eating, what they're doing. It's just like, like their own little Truman show on their TikTok or on their Instagram and their Instagram stories. And so what's interesting is that people are voluntarily um, documenting themselves and putting it out there as if it's like in their own reality TV channel. And, and make no mistake, TikTok is reality TV in a way. And Instagram is a is a, like a form of the same thing of documentation of a person's reality. And I look at The Truman Show as a clear-cut example of Obviously, technology was not as advanced back then when they made the movie, but it is still so very relevant to this day. Because if you look at someone's uh, in social media, it's basically like a reality TV channel of their life. If you if you think about it that way, yeah, they're living their lives online. Yeah, but do- also the documentation of their life, like how Truman is not he's involuntarily being documented. Now people voluntarily document themselves. It's really interesting. I would love to also talk about Ex Machina a little more. Well, there's one more simulation movie before we get into it. Get to it, man. Source Code. Oh, yeah. Source Code's a really fantastic film. It was Duncan Jones' follow-up to Moon. He's got two on here, yeah. Yeah, he's, it's, he's a great sci-fi director. I hope he goes back into science fiction, although Mute was not very good. His uh, It was like a spin-off of, of Moon. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> but I love Source Code. Jake Gyllenhaal plays uh, a... Uh, army he plays a soldier who was i don't want to spoil it too much for those who haven't seen it well actually just i'm gonna spoil it just we're, spoiler we're warning for two hours. source code yeah we recommend if you haven't seen it go watch it it's awesome and yeah if you have if you want to watch if you haven't seen it just skip ahead like two minutes well when we're done talking about it but he plays a soldier who was horribly wounded in combat he's barely alive he's on life support and so a military facet uh, of technology development they have this program called source code which is still experimental. So they're trying it out where they can take a soldier and put him into the memory of someone who recently died. And there's a there was a terrorist attack on a train and they put Jake Gyllenhaal into the, me- they gave him the last eight minutes of memory of a passenger on that plane who fit a, a similar build and body type and brain structure as Jake Gyllenhaal so they can mesh together really well. And now source code discovered that when a person dies, their brain's, have like eight minutes of memory basically like the last eight minutes that they can recall before death and so jake gyllenhaal relives this eight minute increment over and over again of this guy on the train and his objective is to find out where the bomb is who the bomber is to prevent future attacks from happening later that day in the city of chicago and so basically he goes through this simulation program over and over and over again it's like a video game he's trying to he's trying to beat the game basically trying to solve the problem and as he's doing so he's developing uh, an emotional connection with a woman on the train, as well as getting to know the other passengers, as uh, in a in a way, as well as learning about himself and what really happened to him 
in real life that he because he's being lied to he doesn't know why he's there he thinks at first this is just all a test and it's not him in the mirror he's understanding that he's somebody else exactly and what ends up happening is he solves the problem stops the uh, figures figures out the name of the bomber and prevents an attack in chicago in real life but he asks to go back into the source code one more time to try and save the passengers on the train and to basically do a like perfect completion of the mission and he ends up going back inside one last time and then he's he tells his friend Vera Farmiga the other the military officer who's basically his programmer to to just let him die after that and so he's 8 minutes to solve the problem to save everyone on the train he does it and then what happens is the simulation doesn't stop it continues even when his body dies after the uh, 8 minutes his body dies but he's still in the simulation and it continues and life continues in this simulation in this source code and then he's then you begin to realize oh every time they plug them into source code they were creating an alternate reality a multiverse a new dimension a new verse of a, basically a simulated copy what was a simulation ends up relearned being a real place a real thing with real people and these are all you could say souls and so he gets to live a new life in this new universe and what's so fascinating about the ending of the movie is the source code and this mission objective he solves hadn't really happened yet technically because he prevents it from happening the people who run source code they in don't his, in the new one yeah yeah they don't know that there was a bomb that was prevented it never goes off so they don't even know that their program prevented a terrorist attack and they think that oh i guess we'll just try to see if we can get an, like another job because yeah. we're losing funding yeah. and we're, they're gonna cut the cord soon but yeah. they don't realize they that it worked yeah because in the same in the new world he's in he stopped the bomb from going off so they source code never had a chance to try an experiment with a, a recent terrorist attack and so He's in. He's he's in the new. He's in the new universe as this guy, this teacher now. But his body, as a soldier, is still at the source code facility in this universe, not in the in, not in the old reality. It's a trip. It's a great. It's, it's. I think it's really smart. I think it's really cool. It is a cool movie. Now yeah. let's get into Ex Machina. Yeah, that's it for simulation movies. Now Ex Machina was written and directed by Alex Garland, and this is an excellent film. One of my favorite sci-fi movies this century for sure it's really intelligent and clever and so it's about this we talked about it earlier this social media mogul genius tech billionaire who develops ai technology with the cyborg and he has one of his employees who supposedly wins a contest he thinks he is but didn't technically win a contest was chosen to run a turing test on his new cyborg which we find out is like the seventh version or seventh model to determine whether or not this rob this android has self consciousness is self aware with the Turing test, and I love this movie because it shows the the relationship between a human and a supposed AI program on a different level than we never seen before. Because now we have this cyborg who is a robot, but then eventually dresses herself to look more human and a connection develops between Caleb and Ava. And we think that, you know, they're going to work together and Nathan's an evil guy and she's trying to get him on his side. And her, he, Nathan tells Caleb when he gets there, Ava has an objective. Her objective is to escape her box, escape this, this prison that she's in. And Caleb is coerced by Ava and tricked by Ava into thinking that there is a, an emotional connection between the two of them. And she uses that to her advantage to make him think that she could be self-aware and is self-conscious to escape her box. So she obviously gets out and she kills Nathan. And also she traps Caleb there forever to starve to death, probably inside that bunker. No one knows they're even there, you know? And... I look at it and then Ava escapes and she goes into the real world and she goes where she's always wanted to go. And Caleb asked her those questions like, where would you go? I would go to a traffic intersection because you could see everything about a human about human life at a traffic intersection it seems the most interesting place to go. And she goes there at the end of the film. And But the op the ending of the movie is, is ambiguous. Does she have self-awareness? Is she self-conscious? Is she a true AI? Is it true artificial intelligence? And every time I watch the movie, I think that Ava does not have self-consciousness or self-awareness. She's programmed to escape the box. She did. She escaped that box. Then she escaped another box. 
I think that she's just a program that's almost there, almost at self-awareness, almost at self-consciousness, isn't quite there. She just did what she had to do to to uh, to succeed her objective of escaping. I would say it's a it's a it's a great debate. I think that she does have have self-consciousness, and it's in her does it, her killing of Nathan and her real desire to be free and i think that she goes to the traffic stop she wants to blend in and i look at it as she she wants to try and live a life and not just be an experiment and not just be a test and that desire i'd say informs me that she does have self-awareness and, and the consciousness and the reason why she but she also is doesn't have empathy towards humans because she understands that she is not human. It's not like she's questioning, am I human or not? It's more of like, am I conscious or not? Am I am I a living thing? I think that's the case. She just isn't, she's not like the other other films of with similar themes where they're questioning their humanity. She's not questioning, am I, do I have humanity? It's like, am I a being? And I think she does. It's kind of like her, where... Uh, the software doesn't think it's human, but it's it is it believes that it's alive and it believes that it's a consciousness. It believes that it exists as a being, and I think that's the same thing with Ava, and that's why she she kills Nathan. That's why she's able to trap Caleb without feeling remorse for it because she looks at human beings as a, a different kind of species and probably much lower than her as a sentient um, being. Let's get into Black Mirror, which is something that we've never really talked about before, just dabbled here and there. But I, I want to go in depth on some of our favorite episodes of Black Mirror and the technology involved in them. I think one of my favorites is from the episode Crocodile. This is that complete memory mm -hmm. recall. And Toby Kebbell, he's he's the lead in this one. And it's this really fascinating technology where everyone has this device. It's like a contact lens, right? Where yeah. it has every memory you've ever had stored that you can access at any time you want. And people use them 24-7. You can see the benefits of it. Like when he walks up to the door and he's like, oh crap, what was what was her name? My my wife's friend's name because I, I forgot. And he goes back into his memory, sees the first time they met and he remembers, okay, that's, their, that's her name. So now I know her name when I say hi to her so I can act like I remember who she is even though I didn't. <laughs> then there's the the, the cons where him and his wife are being intimate, but they're both recalling memories of their past, watching memories from from in this in, from their memory bank mm -hmm. rather than being intimate with each other in the moment. But this episode shows the major cons it can have. And I think it's just a really fascinating episode and piece of technology that they did in the, in the series. And it's all, I mean, it's just truly horrifying to be at the idea that someone can block you from even seeing or interacting with them, hearing their voice. Can't even, can't even make out their image when you look at them. It's just a fascinating idea. And it led to him discovering the infidelity, right? And in, in them yeah. breaking up. I really love the, the Star Trek episode, USS Callister, because it also involves cloning as well as a simulation. It combines two great sci-fi elements, cloning, simulation together, where Jesse Plemons plays this character who works at a tech company that makes simulation software. And he's very unpopular. He's a weird guy. He's also been muscled out of power and control of the company by his former friend who's now just like the CEO. He's just basically been a push, passive pushover his whole life. No friends, no romantic interests. But what he and he also takes things very personally by people in the office like when they might do something that's maybe not rude or he just misconceives things as bullying or as someone um, being mean to him or rejecting him. And he takes it very personally. And his way of getting back to them, back at them, is he takes a sample of their DNA and puts it into his simulation that he has at home. He has a simulation uh, as the where he is the commander of a spaceship, similar to like a Star Trek kind of ship, where they're exploring the universe, getting on adventures. And his crew are people who, from his work, who he's taken their DNA, cloned them, and put them into the simulation. But what's fascinating is it. They are those people when they're put in the simulation, they have all the memories of that person from his workforce. And so when the new worker who he has a crush on, then she rejects him, he takes her DNA, puts her in the simulation, she wakes up in the simulation. It is still, she is 100% like that person in the real world, but now she's stuck in the simulation and all these people are trapped there and they're basically 
at the beck and whim of Jesse Plemons' character as the boss, as the commander, and he's abusive, he's terrible. He gets out all of his frustrations on these people and basically torments and tortures them on a regular basis. It's a really fascinating concept of being trapped in someone else's simulation. It's basically a prison for the characters. Another prison episode is 15 million metrics. Oh my was god, this, yeah. Was this the first episode or no? Second episode. Second episode. The first one was uh, with Rory Kinnear. And this one was starring uh, Daniel Kaluuya. This is a, a big episode for him. Like I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I recognize him from Black Mirror now. They, they maybe forgot about this episode. But this is the one where all these people... They have this daily routine, this job, this mundane life where they are on cycles, uh, bicycles, stationary cycle bikes, and they are in this like program. They're they're re- looking at these screens and they get mon- monetary value and, and currency from these machines. And they get benefits. And the, Daniel Kaluuya plays this character Bing, who is trying to he, he's understanding what he really is and who they really are and what they're doing, and he's trying to get out of it. And so he's trying to like be get the most advancements out of out of his scores and everything, which is really interesting. And then the end of the episode is really great because he thinks he's reached the real world. He's like got this big ass suite and he's got a view out the of these windows that you can see outside. But really, he's just in a bigger prison because it's all still part of the simulation start of the program because they're powering the world with their cycling. And they're trying to keep the the corporation or whoever is doing it, the government is trying to keep them more and more docile. But yeah, and he also he gives all of his credits to the to the girl mm-hmm. to so that she can get it to she can get out. He sacrifices his credits to help her get out. And he never he never yeah. escapes. He just gets into a larger room, a larger prison. Yeah, San Junipero is a, another great simulation one, which I found fascinating. Where older people, especially who live in nursing homes, who uh, need assistance just living. They often spend most of their times in a simulation called San Junipero. There's a bunch of different simulations. This one in particular is like very 80s themed and they get to be youthful again. They get to uh, go out to bars as young versions of themselves. They get to socialize, date people, party, and just basically feel alive again, which they never felt alive. And it's a very great romance story, uh, really tragic, beautiful, funny Really one of the highlights of the Black Mirror franchise, I would say, just San Junipero. That episode, now that you're talking about it, it reminds me of episode three for The Last of Us. That felt like kind of like a San Juniper episode where it's like this oasis in this in this world. Yeah. And you, there's that, like a little a little tiny bubble of love and hope in a beautiful relationship existing in the rest of this negativity. It's, it's actually kind of reminds me of that. Oh, I totally agree. I love the uh, virtual gaming one where, what's, what's it called? It's, it's the Striking Vipers. The and, VR one, yeah, the VR one. Oh my god! Where that's um, uh, Russell, right? Uh, Kurt Russell's son. Yeah, Russell Wyatt Russell. Wyatt Russell, I believe that was his like first big acting role as a lead for a lead. Yeah, yeah. and he goes into this gaming testing virtual reality program oh with god. that headset. It's terrifying. It's like a horror video game, and I don't want to spoil it at the end. Actually, we shouldn't be spoiling all these episodes, but we kind of are. Eh, whatever. But it, whatever. We, we can't talk about it if we don't spoil it. True, them. but like. It's a really fascinating sense of time where he's like spending so much time in this VR program, this horrifying like horror game, and eventually it's only been a couple of seconds, but it, doesn't it fry his brain, right? Yeah, it affects him really negatively. It's it's crazy episode. I really like Hang the DJ, which is like a dating app one where people are assigned to go on dates with other members of the app, and it's kind of like a blind date thing. But the problem, and it's like this culture where you're assigned who you go on dates with, and you're also, it's predetermined how many dates you go on and how much time you spend with them. And so, like, when you go on a date with someone, it's already predetermined that you'll go on two dates with them, or, like, you'll, your relationship will last, like, two months, then it's over, and then you can't see them again. Or your relationship will last, like, six months, or it will just, like, last one night, one one date. It's all predetermined, and they, they have to follow the strict rules of how, when you can see someone. And then the two lead characters of the of the episode, they have a date and it goes really well, but they're assigned to only go out like three times and then that's it. But they don't want to go out with any other people, but they they can't they can't find the other person. There's no way for them to contact them because everything's already determined for them. And so it's just a fascinating thing of like uh, not having control of your social life, not and how dating apps can kind of take away the humanity in dating. And we all. 
in a way are the like if you've used dating apps, you're determined. You're you're putting numbers on people in a, in a way, and this episode really translates that really well, I think. But they end up being there in a program. Yeah, it's it's, it's a, all it's a, a random yeah. it's simulated program, yeah. and then it ends like they're on the dating app. So yeah. it, it harkens to I can't remember what dating app it was where it's like shows the the match probability or com, or like yeah percentage. compatibility. Yeah, it, it's kind of it's that's like a brilliant concept for this episode where they're just running programs of your profile against every other program in a simulation to see which would be the most m- compatible and just bringing it down to a narrative in a TV episode was was so genius. Exactly. I, I one another one that I think was maybe the most disturbing for me personally when I watched it it was the John Ham one where White Christmas. White Christmas yeah. where it's like the real life blocking thing and also because it ends where he gets put like you put like someone inside like that little machine, right? Inside uh he's inside like a device. Yeah. But it's actually like a a person's consciousness. Yeah. It's like a new consciousness of that person. And it ends where he's trapped inside that cabin. And I remember the guys like it, for the time difference, like they don't age at all. It's just you're constantly there. I can't remember what it was. It's it's worse than Miller's Planet in Interstellar. It's like one minute is like a year or something like that. It's crazy. And the guys let it run for the weekend because I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but they discovered something terrible about the guy that he did. And they, yeah, I'm trying to remember. they let him run it for the week. They let, let the weekend of him running inside that simulation, inside that device. So it's like literally an eternity of him being in that cabin without an escape. He can't even leave the doors. He can't leave through the windows. He's in a cabin for an eternity until they let him back out. It's crazy. That was a Christmas special. Terrifying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think they put you inside the device, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it starts off where there's a version of you in a device and you tell it to do stuff around the house right yes yeah 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 yeah. and then you like eventually, it starts out innocent yeah and then you tra- after it starts acting up you train it with like shock treatment or like with the treatment where the, you keep them in a, in that place for like a week with yeah no interactions and they go crazy and it's like all right make sure the house is set to 72 degrees like turn my lights on right now <laughs> like it's crazy but then but the ending when he's trapped in there for an eternity even though he's a douchebag pos it's it like after that episode ended i was like having a panic attack Oh, same. There's another. There's a great one. Um, the mother one. Who? Who's the actress in that one? Was it Hilary Swank? Mirror. Which mother one? It's about the mother who can track her kid. Mother, daughter episode. Sorry, one sec. You're good, man. Rosemary think- Dewitt. So, um, Rosemary Dewitt plays this woman who. There's a near fatal accident with her toddler daughter. And so she gets this chip that she puts in her daughter. It's a tracking chip. And that way, like, oh, I, I can always know where she is. And then it cuts to, like, 10 years later when the daughter is a teenager. And she stopped using the tracking device, like, years ago. But the chip is still there in her. And then her and her daughter are having arguments, like many parents and children do when kids hit, hit a certain age. And then she can tell, like, her daughter's lying to her about things. And then... She goes up into the attic and she's like, she pulls out that old app that she had to track her. And then she begins tracking everything that her daughter does, where she is, like what she's doing, follows her and show it's, and, and it shows the, the paranoia that it can cause. Like having that technology is great to a certain extent, but then it can get overboard and it leads to a terrible conflict in the, in the story. That's awesome. That's a, it's a great idea. Black Mirror in general is just a great anthology series you know it's it's like twilight zone but modern day contemporary yeah. technology based versus like sci-fi horror but sci-fi is part of it and horror is part of it as well but i love how it relates to technology and then you hear about stories of new technology being developed right now like i remember i was watching a video on this new tech that was just being shown at a conference somewhere where we were talking about before the episode oh brainwave tracking where like an employer you like wear these earbuds these these headsets and wear them while you're at work and your employer tracks your brain waves for the entire time you're at work so they can tell whether you're being productive they can tell whether you're daydreaming they can tell if you're paying attention to your work or not they can tell if you're actually doing work or if you're just looking like you're doing work and you're like on a different 
website you're not supposed to be on. Like if you're on a social media website or if you're Amazon shopping or browsing or, or on YouTube, it can tell by your brainwave functions what kinds of things you're doing and it, you'll be monitored and you can monitor your employees. Basically, your mind is not even safe anymore from yeah. being turned into a prison. And you can get like rating system. You can get graded on your brainwave functions and that could it can play a major factor in maintaining a job and that's terrifying that's scary to not even to think that you don't even have control of your own thoughts it's one of those things where like as an employer yeah i want to make sure my employees are actually getting the work done that i pay them for but at the same time should we be invasively imprisoning somebody's mind and not even giving them the space of their brain which you all assumed was never going to be tapped into and you'd always have control of and will always be yeah. personal and private to you no longer will be personal personal and private to you if this gets implemented on a large scale. That will take away a person's humanity in a lot of ways. Their inability to let their mind work. You know what I mean? Worker bees. Yeah. That's, Fight club. I think that's terrifying and a horrible technology that should, ne should never be developed. It's one of those things. It's like, should we keep going in that direction? No should we way. keep developing that? You understand both sides of why a company would want to do that or an employer would want to add that. But man, just look at their screens or like have them like just turn their desks so that you can see their display yeah. like if you really want to know what they're doing all day yeah like you're going to be inside or, or as long as they as long as they get the work done then it doesn't matter it's pretty scary it's scary it's scary because like what if that gets into the wrong hands on a huge scale yeah like that's that's terrifying yeah and like what if a government starts using a technology like that that's scary that's, that's thought, horrifying that's thought that's like that's 1984 yeah. you can say the concept of thought police, thought police. and yeah. you're not supposed to have specific thoughts if they yeah. can track what you're thinking thought think think crime think stuff. crime yeah. yeah also i think ai art is something that's kind of worrying like it's cool to see like oh ai can make like really weird looking photographs or cool art or just like just really bizarre stuff and also People are making AIs that can like tell stories and like write TV shows and write movies. I'm worried that, you know, and also I, I saw a few months ago, I can't remember, I don't know what museum it was, but some museum, I don't know where it was, but put a, dis a huge display of AI art and like a ton of people showed up to watch to, to see the art. And it's like, is that scary to think that AI can have a major influence on art and media? And will it get to the point where like, in like 20 years, will like studios be having just AI computers making TV shows and movies? And there are just very simplified versions of these AI programs. I saw one yesterday where this company designed an AI program that creates versions of, creates Seinfeld episodes. And so it, it creates a crude animation and storyline, but it's like a Seinfeld episode based upon past Seinfeld episodes and stuff. So and it's obviously so super cheesy and very, very crude version of it, but it's a it's a step in that direction. You know what I mean? It's just like the earliest stage of that, you know, the final stage of that could be in twenty years, like AI could be making entire T V programs or entire movies completely animated, completely AI. No one's acting in it. There's no real voices in it. Everything is done by an AI, but it looks real. That scares me. And then it's who's coding it. What biases are being put into the coding that we don't know about? Obviously, you know, any script or anything has a bias to the writer, but does the coding have a non-objective bias for the kinds of content it's going to create? But I, I just think the, the worrying, I worry about eliminating humanity from art. Which is the whole scary. the point of art is human expression, and so if you take the human out of the expression, that's scary. Scary stuff, man. Yeah, wow, it's wild. It, it, it's nuts. This conversation was a little scary, but yeah. a little fun. There's too. some other quick yeah. ones we can run through. Westworld, the concept of yeah. humanity with that, with the cyborgs, basically again, and another another real yeah. life simulation like the Truman Show. Minority Report, we kind of just we dabbled in earlier, but also the Think Crime is kind of a similar concept with Minority Reports. Artificial intelligence, pre crime, AI, AI pre crime, yeah, pre crime, AI, artificial intelligence, the Spielberg movie, humanity uh, are these, do these people, do these AI beings have souls? Her, we talked about transcendence, the Wally Fister film starring Johnny Depp, transcending into code basically is that the next step for human evolution? War Games is a great um, AI, also uh, digital frontier kind of hacking movie. Star Trek Generations that deals with one of the main characters is an artificial intelligence cyborg. Okay. RoboCop. Oh, yeah. We have is 
the Robocop, does he still have his humanity even though he's part machine? Mm. And, you know, I think that wraps up like basically all the movies that we would that really was, want to talk yeah, about. Yeah, that was great. I love the I love the topic and I love these genres of movies. This is this is a great chat, man. Yeah. Holy I crap. like talking about tech and stuff. It's fascinating stuff. And futurism. It's fascinating. It's scary but fascinating and intriguing. Yeah. And it's it's a cool topic because we're living in it. But we, we love sci-fi films yeah. and I love whenever technology is involved and there's the man versus machine, humanity versus technology genres. So cool when you get something new and yeah. fresh. Like I think that's why I like Ex Machina so much because it presents the questions of humanity and AI in a new way versus what we'd seen in the 90s, 2000s. Yeah, I agree. And I hope you all enjoyed this chat. Thank you so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Again, the best way to support our show is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Beep, beep, boop, beep, beep. I am a human. This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Luke Exelston, Tyler McFly, Darren Singleton, Anthony DeMeo, John A. Graz, Becca Keen, Cody Moen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Cam, Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.